While deployed to Iraq with the army, one night I'd been assigned evening guard duty in one of the camp's perimeter towers. These towers were just upended concrete pipe, 10 feet in diameter, with a roof, floor, and a ladder inside. It was only two stories up, and in each tower was a, a set of night vision goggles, a pair of binoculars, a machine gun, a radio, and a spotlight. There were two of us per tower on each shift, and on this night, it was me and my buddy Smith. It was a quiet, cloudless, moonlit night. So our camp was small, and it was situated on a low hill. Five towers in total protected the perimeter, with number three being the one facing the rear of the camp. We had mostly an unobstructed view out for at least a mile in all directions, but there were small hills and valleys, no more than six feet deep at the most. Otherwise, it was just empty desert. While we scanned our sector, Smith and I, we just shot the breeze. We complained about the war, talked about going back home, having a beer and meeting girls. It was the best way to pass the time, really. Then at some point during the night, we hear what... I can only describe as the shriek. It was like nothing that I'd ever heard before. The sound came from somewhere off in the dark, maybe 30 or 50 yards away from us. It was short, barely a second and a half long, sharp and loud, ascending in pitch, something that could have been either woman, child, or animal in distress, or an animal in anger, I guess, but it stopped my heart, whatever it was. It was even more frightening in contrast to the calm quiet of the evening. But then it happened again. And then again. Smith, you hear that man? I asked. Yeah, what the heck is that? He said, grabbing the binoculars and looking out. I don't know, man, but whatever it is, it's freaky. I said. Get the light out there, Smith said. I got the spotlight out, scanning the desert. But there was nothing out there. I kept moving back and forth. Get the night vision, Smith said. Again, I scanned the desert for as far as I could see, but there was nothing. Just empty night air. We got on the radio to the watch commander. HQ, this is Tower 3. Did you hear that? Over. The radio cracked, then responded. Uh, negative 3. What am I supposed to hear? But then the noise had stopped. We described what we were hearing and asked the other towers if they heard anything, but no one but us heard it. Watch Commander checked back with us a couple of times, then came up and looked for himself. He tried the night vision, then the binoculars with the spotlight, but nothing but sand. The shrieking was gone, and all was quiet again. We finished the shift with no more interruptions, just the same as before, except for one difference, I guess. I stayed perched on that machine gun, watching the night, all night. In the morning after we were replaced, Smith, myself, and another buddy from the watch commander's office, we went out the gate and headed in the direction of the noise. About 30 yards from the gate was the most horrific thing that I had ever seen. Scattered in about an 8 foot diameter was a, a splashing of just an absolute mess with bits of flesh and you name it. And none of us could tell if it was human or animal, but whatever it was... Almost nothing was left of it. What scared us most, though, is that from the side of the blood, we had a direct line of sight straight to Tower 3. And even without the spotlight, we should have been able to see whatever had taken place here. But neither of us in the tower saw whatever did this. Even the watch commander himself came out to investigate. A report was made and a brief search of the area was conducted. But strangely, there were no footprints or even paw prints. No drag marks, no patterns, nothing. Whatever it was, it shrieked three times, left nothing but blood and flesh and an absolute mess, and then just disappeared. It was well within eyesight of us, but it was never spotted, and honestly, it just seemed to vanish. It's been years now, and I can still hear that desperate noise, and man, every time I think about it, it gives me chills. This all happened way back in 1985 and 1986, but they are things that my friend and I will never forget.
So I was working the summers at an old retreat in the North Carolina mountains with about 50 other young adults. It was great fun too. And while the place had lots of modern buildings, it was ruled over by a hulking white building built in 1912. I think it's important to note too that most of the building is just an extension of the mountain itself. It was built using the trees from the right where it stands as well as the rocks and the shoulders used for the foundation. It's three stories, but really five counting the basement and the attic full of bats. It was great watching them pour out of there every night too. The front of the building is an enormous portico with white columns stretching up all three stories. That porch is full of rocking chairs from which you can see a majestic view of the Smoky Mountains. But the back of the building is where we worked. We entered our housekeeping facilities via a fire escape that stretched straight up to the second floor rear entrance, a single green metal door. That door was one that I knew well. Housekeeping was my department for three summers, and even though this was now just the end of this first summer, I was well acquainted with it already. It was big, green, metallic, and heavy as all heck, with a pull on the outside and a bar to push on the inside to open it. It didn't stay open though, in fact fire regulations required that it stay closed at all times, and it was engineered to shut automatically too. So of course, during the summer with no air conditioning in the building, we kept it propped open with a full bucket of water during the day, regulations be damned. Anyway, a few nights before we left we were all cleaning our dorms and trying to turn it into a party when we all ran out of cleaning supplies. So around 9 o'clock at night, my best friend and I drive our lazy butts down to the back of the building. It was only a short distance, but there was a very steep incline that we didn't want to walk down. I parked my car right in front of the stairs and we got out. At this point, we both began to feel odd too. For some reason, the air was still and stuffy and I felt positively enveloped by this building, standing in the middle with those massive wings rising around us. The building was completely dark, and since we had been shutting it down for the winter, it was already locked up tight. My friend had been with me earlier in the day when I had locked that door, the one at the top of the stairs. As we climbed the stairs, I felt really oppressed and had to sort of stop for a moment. My friend did too. I told him that I was scared, and he admitted the same, which was really weird. I'd never felt scared of this building before and I'd spent plenty of time in it alone, exploring the basement and even the attic. Trying to push our feelings aside though, we pressed slowly forward again and a few steps up, I just literally felt an icy chill go down my spine. I know it's a stupid cliche, but I've never felt anything like it before or since then, like someone pressed an icicle down the length of my spine. Finally, we reached the top of the stairs and the instant that I put my foot on the top landing, that door swung open, wide as anything, and stood open for us, revealing the short entranceway bathed in the red light of the exit sign. It almost seemed like, whatever it was, it wanted us in there and we both felt it. But it didn't feel welcoming at all. In fact, I've never been more scared of anything in my life. I still get freaked out about it now, 37 years later. But we both stood there, completely stunned for what felt like minutes before I just freaked out, started screaming incoherently and scrambled down the steps, jumping way too many on the way down. We both ran up the steep incline, yelling and screaming, leaving my car behind. Everyone came running down and searched the building with us. And it was empty, of course. And when we got back... The door was shut fast and locked when we got there. No one could have pushed that door open, mind you, and run away without us hearing them. The floors squeaked when you walked on them, and somebody running would have been very loud. I've looked at this from every angle that I can think of, but I still have no explanation for what happened that night. I worked there for three more summers in that building, and have more stories too, but this one... This one always stuck with me. But my friends stayed to work through the winter one year too, and they even saw what they described as a dark man with a hat in the same building. There was something really odd and eerie about that building, and I don't know what it was, but whatever it is, it seems evil.
So my boyfriend, Jason, 27 male, and I, 23 year old female, went on a month long trip camping to multiple states. Everything had been going really well until October 9th, we decided to ditch a campground reservation and we randomly pitch our tent near an Albion Basin within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the lake trailhead there. We parked our car around 3pm at the Albion Basin campground, closed for season. Admittedly it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear or anything. Upon arrival, we realized the area that we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had planned a campsite in Nephi, Utah, that we decided to skip on a whim. So, after grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear that we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 Fahrenheit out. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel a bit strange though, as if we didn't really even know why we were doing this, as if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night, but we both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to the lake, totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. It was disappointing and eerie, to be honest. Whatever. We keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion in flat land when... We stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a heck no kind of situation, but after he checked it out, he says that it seems like a small animal crawl space, so no biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, play some cards, bundle up, and decided to go to bed early, around 8.30pm, as we planned to leave ASAP in the morning, maybe 5 we both sort of dwindle slowly and after what feels like 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24pm. I woke up with a, a feeling that I'd never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in heck that I was going to fall back to sleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep so I let him be and I just laid there alert, trying to listen to anything that I could hear, which was nothing. It was very silent, in fact. Around 12am, Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him that I couldn't sleep, but he suggested that I rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and I say I was pretty scared. This was very short-lived, though, as Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself, and we ended up laying there together, trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. Eventually, though, we agreed that it was fine for us to just stick it through the night, as it was now approaching 2.30 in the morning anyway, and we had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I did not need to be frightened. But not even five minutes later, we're still wide awake, and Jason's head perks up so fast that my heart jumped out of my chest, and I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen, and I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots as if someone walked up to our tent, stopped, and then walked to my side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts and for a millisecond, I was convinced that it was a ranger coming to tell us that we couldn't camp there so I called out, hello, my brain entirely sure that I had heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and bursted out of the tent for any chance to confront this person, as I knew that he heard exactly what I had heard. But, to our absolute shock, nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason bursted out and me after him, there was nobody there. But that made no sense because we definitely heard something or someone walk up so clearly, but nothing walked away. We hardly exchanged two words and we just packed up our stuff looking over our shoulders terrified, feeling watched the entire time, and we booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This 
was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. But when we made it to our car, we locked the doors and we started the descent out of the mountains almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached the town at about 3.30 in the morning and we slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store after that. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night and we are both still haunted by the sound of those footsteps that we heard that night. So I, a 20 year old female, work part time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. I'm a sales associate so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. He was about mid-40s and everything about him was odd. Clothes didn't fit, expensive shoes, socially awkward. He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this though, he continued to ask questions, almost as if he wanted to keep my attention to him. He then asks if he can try out our most expensive item in the store, which is a massage chair, and I said yes. Well, we let everyone try it out. At this point, I just thought that he was innocent yet socially awkward, and he gets into the chair to try it out, continues to ask unusual questions. We chit-chat a bit, and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it. And all of a sudden, the questions get more personal. He asked what high school I went to and if I missed it. Me being naive, I said the high school that I went to and that I didn't miss going. He said some story about a teacher that I'd never heard of and said that he missed high school a lot. He asked if I lived around there, to which I avoided that question, but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the price along with our second most expensive item in the store as well. I thought that he was actually interested and I was convinced that he was about to buy it. But we made commission on the chair so I ignored his creepiness because I wanted to make the sale. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with the chair today and he has a truck that is big enough to hold it. It seemed that I'd finally answered his questions to his liking because I was able to walk away a bit. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, we got one, we got one. I had suspicions, obviously, that he was creepy, but this absolutely confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head, no. He then stood up from the chair and said that he'll not be buying the chair today. I was scared and alone. Nobody else around but me and him. I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance or exit. I didn't want to leave, but I couldn't stay inside the mall. I waited for him to go out of sight and then quickly locked the doors and I ran outside to my car. I called my manager and she said that I have to close the store properly, turn off the lights and count the register and all that. So she told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did that, was escorted back to the store to close up, and was also escorted back to my car with no further incident. Now, I live in a city with one of the highest rates of human and sex trafficking in the country, and I genuinely believe that I was being targeted by a human trafficker that day. I know hearing this secondhand, it may not exactly seem that way, but if you had been there and if you had heard the creepiness and the phone conversation, I honestly think that you would agree with me. I, a female and 26, live in a flat building in a good area. It's a long, windy cul-de-sac, so there's not many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming home from work. My boyfriend... He's away at Thailand for a month and we usually take the dog out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I mean, I usually feel safe. But last week at around 8pm, I left the flat to take my dog for a pee. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. 
She just had a spray surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I'm waiting for my dog to do her business and a car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly sort of neighborly nod towards me so I did a smile back, you know, to be polite and all. The guy parks at the front of the building and I'm at the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog trying to get her to hurry up because it was freezing. I look up and the man is stood outside of his car staring at me now. A little freaked out by this I turn my attention back to my dog. I keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with a really creepy and weird smile on his face. I looked away again for a second and he was walking along the road slowly towards us. I'm a really friendly person, I can be paranoid and aware at times, I know that, as any woman should be at night, but something about him made me feel scared. He's walking so slow as if he wants to talk to me, so I hide behind a van, I know, not my brightest idea, and I'm telling my dog, hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore all of a sudden though, which terrified me to be honest. All I hear are footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van and my dog goes absolutely nuts. She's jumping around, barking aggressively, which she never does with people, and the guy doesn't take that as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that she doesn't want his presence, but even though she's doing this, he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him to please leave as she's just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice too, he asks, what's your name? I couldn't really hear him, to be honest. He kept repeating the question as well, and I eventually understood what he was asking. My dog is still going absolutely nuts at him, mind you. I say again, please, my dog just had surgery. You need to walk away, she's too excited. Ignored again. Walks towards us, asking my name, so I start walking away from him. He seems to ponder for a minute, still smiling, creepily may I add. He eventually backs up slowly, still facing me, and I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds, walking backwards like that, never letting his eyes off of me. Eventually though, he walks back to his car normally, looks over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend that my dog is doing something when she's really just being a pain in the butt and just standing there. I look up and all of a sudden he's gone. I'm shaking now, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on. She's telling me just go inside, but she doesn't realize that I'm frozen in fear. Eventually though, I, I see a woman and her son rock up at the front door, so I half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. The front of our building has glass doors. I glance in and the man is standing there waiting for us. I told the woman, this man has been following me and my dog and I'm scared and she walks in with me. The man sees that I'm not alone and walks right past us out of the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decided to tell my two male neighbors about it as my boyfriend is away and they agree to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration plate as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him obviously. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11am just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're headed to the lift I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He was looking for me and he started walking towards me. At first I didn't recognize him but then he smiled his creepy smile and I realized who it was instantly. He said hi, so I said hey, then beeline for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I pressed the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me. Again, my dog is going absolutely nuts at him. He asks what my name was. He has an accent. He asked again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, what, my dog's name or mine? He goes, yours, and smiles. I froze and I said a fake name. And then he started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about to open and I could run away. But he told me his name and I replied, nice to meet you. 
Finally, the lift doors opened. I walk in and I press the button to my floor, hoping that he would leave me alone. But he ran behind me as I walked in and went, I'd like to see you again. That was weird. I was creeped out. I replied that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. As I said this, the lift doors were closing, and he tried to stick his hand out to stop the lift from closing. But thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was afraid that he was going to run up so that he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get into my home and lock the doors. The lift opens, and thankfully he's not there, so I beeline to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear that I saw someone coming up. I ran in, I locked the front door as quickly as I could, and I was just so confused about what just happened. The next thing that I do is message everyone with the update. They told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on a record, so I did that, and the police arrived at my flat at 3pm. I explained everything to them, and they said that I could either A, get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B, next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone, and if he doesn't, phone the police as it would then be considered harassment. For now, the police really couldn't do more, which is fair enough, I guess. I didn't want to anger him at this stage, as it's not a, a crime at this point, I guess you could say, but why can't he just leave me alone? I have no idea. I mean, I clearly showed that I was not interested, and it just annoys me that this is happening to me. I hate saying something's going on when maybe it isn't, but I just have a terrible gut feeling that there's something very wrong with this guy, and that this is not the last that I'll see of him. This was a few years ago now. It was pretty late, past 1.30 or 2 in the morning. I was living with this boy who was pretty abusive and he had gotten really jealous at this party that we were at earlier that night. Not even an hour after we had gotten home, he tossed me out onto our front porch and locked the door behind me. I was knocking and pleading for him to please let me back inside. I was still wearing what I had worn to the party and it was freezing out. I really wasn't sure what to do. He had my phone, purse, and wallet in the house with him, so I just sat on the porch, crying. When he turned off the lights, both inside and outside of the house, I knew that he wasn't going to let me back in. I felt really helpless and cold, and I thought about knocking on a neighbor's door, though he didn't have many, but I had anxiety about waking anyone up and causing trouble for my boyfriend too, so... Instead, I decided that I would try to walk to this gas station and motel, which was like a little less than a mile away, so I could use their phone to try and call a girlfriend of mine to see if I could sleep over with her. Ironically enough, the road that I was walking on, Donna Pass Road, being so freezing cold was fitting. But anyway, a little bit into the walk, this tall white pickup truck was approaching on the opposite side of the road that I was on. I tried not to make eye contact for obvious reasons, but then I heard the truck stopping and beginning to make a U-turn, and my heart just started pounding when that happened. I just about froze up, but forced myself to speed walk at the very least, and the truck pulled up to me and this guy rolled down his window and asked what I was doing out this late. I told him how I was going to meet my friend at the gas station and that she was expecting me. He sort of smiled and offered me a ride. I said no thank you, citing that I shouldn't hitchhike, and he told me, well good, I don't pick up hitchhikers or anyone, you don't look like a hitchhiker though, you just look like you need some help. He just kept driving next to me and told me that I shouldn't think that he was a creep, and he pulled out what looked like a police badge and told me that he had just gotten off duty, which is why he was in civilian clothes and out so late. He said that he wouldn't mind driving next to me, just to make sure that I get where I was heading safely. I'll admit that I was naive and a bit too trusting of his kindness and credentials, and when he offered me a ride again, I said that it would be nice because the gas station wasn't that far away anyway. So he popped the door open for me and I hopped in. The radio was low. It was a little messy. The ashtray was full of cigarettes. But there were a lot of newspapers on the passenger floor, and as I was moving my feet... Some of the papers shifted, showing a, a pair of handcuffs, some coffee cups, empty water bottles, rags, 
a highlight colored bandana, and a few other things. He apologized, saying that it was the truck that he took hunting, but it was super warm, so I was happy and I didn't mind at all. He told me his name was John. He asked why I was scantily dressed with a jacket, and I started to tell him about the party and the fight that I had with my boyfriend. He was super charming, actually, and really attentive. He even laughed that he could go back and arrest him if I wanted. I asked about him, and he told me about his family. He was a young dad. He had a wife, a daughter, a son, and a dog. I told him that it was like he had the perfect little family, and he laughed and said that he certainly did. Then it had sort of clicked for me to ask him if I could use his phone, but he said no because he had to save his battery. We were approaching the gas station, and then he drove right past it. I politely said, oh, I think that's the one, but he didn't answer me. It was then that I felt sick to my stomach, and my heart started pounding again. I started getting choked up, my eyes started tearing up, and... I was looking out of the windows and watching the lights behind us getting further and further away. It was hard for me to even speak, but somehow I murmured, asking if he could please turn around and he just ignored me. Whenever I would look at him, he just looked empty-eyed and emotionless, totally dead and glazed. I looked back out the window and down at the road to see if maybe we were going slow enough that I could make a leap out of the car without seriously injuring myself. I remember always hearing never go to the second location, but I thought about the possibility of jumping out and breaking an ankle and how it would be a lot harder to get away with one foot as opposed to two, debating with myself that there was snow on the ground, but then again, snow is hard to get along in, and especially when you're not fully clothed like I was. I felt so stupid now too because I wasn't even tied up or anything. I was just so scared though, like there was nothing but trees, an empty road, and me and this guy. I was crying pretty badly at this point and asked if I could please borrow his phone again. I don't know why I even asked. I think it was just anxiety and fear. But he told me to stop talking. Then he started talking underneath his breath saying, Girls shouldn't be out so late. You shouldn't have been alone this late. Look what you're doing to me, dressed like that. And other derogatory things. As he kept saying these terrible things, too many to share here, I wasn't even responding. I was just crying and trying to think past the fear that I was feeling. I remembered the pair of handcuffs that I saw under the papers beneath my feet, so I used that little, I don't know how to describe it, like scoopy motion. I managed to use my feet to scoop the handcuffs up and I used my heels and toes to push them under the bottom of my seat as far as I could. I was thinking of different things that I could do to try and help myself, like if we were close enough to some upcoming lights or structures, if I ever made it to them, I could just grab the wheel and cause us to crash into them, or maybe how if I got lucky enough for a cop to pass us, I could grab the wheel and swerve so that he would appear to be a, a drunk driver and we'd get pulled over. I guiltily thought about the possibility of this man as just having a weird night and how if I did anything it would hurt him, but... I told myself that that sort of thinking sort of got me into this mess in the first place, so I was done with that. He pulled off the road where there were still woods on both sides of us. On his side of the wooded trees were closer to the road, and on mine, there was a small gap fully covered in thick, I don't know how many feet of snow, but it was a lot, before the trees thickly picked up again, maybe 10 to 16 yards away. He turned off the car eventually, and coldly said that, there was something wrong with the car and to get out with him. As he grabbed the keys and was stepping out of the car, I grabbed onto the center console and I cried and pleaded not to make me get out with him because it was too cold. He turned around to face me, his door still open, and shouted at me to get out of the car because we had to go check out the trunk bed hatch. I dug my fingernails deeper into the console, thinking my cries of no and head shaking would cause him to come around to my side of the car and drag me out himself. I was crying and said, Please, John, I'm so cold and scared. I was thinking of everything that I'd ever heard. Humanize yourself. Use first names. Stuff like this. He stared at me in this, like, way I can't even describe to this day. I don't even know how to start, but he got back in the car and I slinked towards my window, scared that he would drag me over the console. He turned off the headlights and everything just looked 
completely dark blue. He stared at the steering wheel for what felt like years before, lighting a cigarette and looking at his window, back at me and then back out his window. He heard me shuffle my feet on the newspapers. I was adjusting my legs. But while still staring out his window, he told me if I thought about running, he had a quick way to get me where he wanted me to be. And oddly enough, I was sort of thinking of running minutes before that. But I reasoned that if he wanted me out of the car, then I should definitely stay in. Otherwise, he could chase me or shoot me in case he had a hunting rifle in the back. I didn't dare look. But I'm glad that I was right. I think at that point I sort of hit some sort of bottom of my reserve and instead of panic, there was numbness and exhaustion. There was still an occasional hot tear or two, but I just remember being numb at this point. I talked to a psychiatrist about this sort of thing and he thinks it's just some from my ex-boyfriend giving me PTSD or something. But it was dead quiet. I finally just barely audibly told him that my friend was still waiting for me and asked about his wife and children and he flatly said that he didn't have a wife or children and that his house was empty. I asked him what he was thinking about and he said, I'm thinking about what to do with you. He didn't say it angrily though, he just said it flatly and coldly which honestly scared me even more. I did start getting worked up to a cry and at that point he told me not to cry and turned the car on offering me some heat but I just cried and said that I wanted to go home. Eventually he started driving and kept driving until we were approaching a gas station. I was gauging the right time to reach for the wheel but before I could he started slowing down. While pulling up, he told me not to tell anyone or he would find me. Then he told me all he was doing was teaching me a lesson not to hitchhike with strangers. He was almost coming to a complete stop when he told me to get out before he changes his mind. Before he could even get another look at me to assess my understanding, I was already down out of that truck and sprinting towards the gas station. The panic was overwhelming me, but then I stopped and remembered to try and see his license plate. I turned around, but... I only caught the blur of the last three numbers as he was driving off. I ran inside and asked the clerk behind the counter to please call the police. I waited until the officer got there and, I'll be honest, I was a little scared that it would be John. My fears melted away when a new-faced policeman got there. I gave him the description of John, his appearance, the vehicle color and the type, the parts of the license plate number that I had caught, the fact that he said that he was an off-duty cop, just basically anything that I could give him. I asked him if he could look at the camera and the officer disappeared in the back for a little bit, then came back out saying that there was really not much on them. I asked if I would be able to look and the officer said no and asked me if I didn't trust him and I told him of course I did. The officer gave me a ride home to my friends though, lecturing me for hitchhiking, consisting of him repeatedly asking if I knew who Ted Bundy was. Of course I knew. I was just naive to think that it would never happen to me and I was desperate for some warmth. In the end, I never heard anything back about the report that was made too, so I would try to follow up and each time that I did, they never got back to me, aside from this one time that I was told that my case number didn't exist. But that didn't stop me from trying to follow up. Throughout the months and years, I asked my friend, whose home I slept over at that one night, if uh, she ever heard of any like weirdness or anything since that incident had happened to her or anyone up here and she always says no. So in the end I just sort of had to let it go and try to tell myself that maybe he actually was just trying to teach me a lesson or something. I mean I definitely never hitchhiked again so if it was a lesson it certainly worked. I never heard anything back having to do with the case. I never heard of any other odd experiences up there. Maybe it was just one man trying to teach me something. But honestly, sometimes I think that I tell myself all of that to help me sleep better at night. Because it all felt very, very real. But even if it wasn't real, I'm really glad that I didn't get out of the car in the woods that night. So I used to work in a factory third shift, 
12 hours every night. You'd rely on your partner at work to talk all night to get you through the shift. And I always enjoyed teaming up with this particular dude because we both hold convo as well and always have some interesting stuff to say. Anyways, I'm like 27 at the time and he's in his 50s. I figured that he'd have a crazy story or two, so I asked him about paranormal stuff if he'd experienced anything. He tells me this unbelievable story that I have to say is either true or he copied it from some Amazing Stories episode from the 80s or something like that. But here it is. So there's a town in Ohio that's very old, very wild, forests, and not much around there except a farm or two. And he claims that each time he went out there, he would notice that his watch would malfunction or his compass would act weird and he'd have missing time and things of that nature. So him and his buddy were out there hunting in this forest one day. They hunt all day, don't think that they killed anything, but they decided to leave. But they're hiking back when a dude, about 30 years old, approaches them on a dirt road on a tractor, clearly a, a farmer type guy. He questions my co-worker and friend and tells them that they're hunting on his property. They immediately apologize and strike up a conversation and the farmer man takes a, a likening to them. Tells them that the next time that they're out there, if they should get approached or have any issues, just mention his name and they'll be okay. Well, two or so years go by and they get together again to go hunt on this property. A similar thing happens where a young man riding on a mower or a tractor approaches them and they realize that this is a different guy. They tell the young man that they have permission to be there from the owner, farmer guy from before, and he proceeds to tell me that the young man that they were speaking to gives him a strange look. The man says, you're telling me my farmer man told you guys a couple of years ago that you could hunt out here? They said yes and described the prior interaction. The young man looks puzzled and tells them to follow him back to his old farmhouse. They go inside and... There's a very old man on a hospital type bed in the living room watching TV and hooked up to oxygen. The young man says, Hey dad, these men claim that you talked to them a couple of years ago and gave them permission to hunt? The old man looks at my co-worker and his friend in bewilderment and says, I remember you two. You guys haven't aged a day. It creeped them out obviously, but anyways, I guess they talked for a while when they left and they never went back there after that too freaked out by seeing this guy so old after what had only been like a couple of years but i would like to know what you guys think do you guys think this story is just something made up is this guy that i worked with full of it or is there something truthful going on here so me and my four buddies drew into a two-day hunt on a reserve Day one, about 8.30 in the morning, about 500 yards from my spot, my buddy filmed a really fat black bear. We only had muzzle loaders. They're like a Civil War style gun that you get one shot with when you're going to reload with the ramrod and stuff. I never saw any deer, so at 2pm after lunch, me and another buddy scout for a new spot. We find a hellacious animal trail and he drops me off. I tell him pick me up and I'll be on the road after dark. He's about 7 miles away. I sit there from 2pm till dark. All I see are loads of elk. The trail wasn't deer, it was elk highway, so it gets dark and I creep down to the road. Right at dusk, almost too dark to see. Something comes crashing in the thick bushes about 30 yards in front of me across the road. I think to myself, huh, maybe it's a deer? So I grunt call just to get a reaction, but nothing. So I creep on thinking that I can bust it if it's a deer. But it doesn't budge. It's sniffing like a dog would. I kick the ground and stomp trying to bump it. But it just keeps sniffing. I remember that bear and I'm like 10 feet from whatever this is. I slowly back into a feed plot behind me with my one shot at my hip. I'm going to have to hip shoot it if it is a bear. I get 50 yards in the middle of a field plot. A big bull elk off to my right in the full moonlight, staring too at whatever this thing is. I see something drive out of the bushes, into the thicket across the road to my left, so I run further out, and it's a standoff. I shine my light into the thicket, and I see eyes reflecting back. 
They look eight inches apart at least. Uh, maybe four foot off the ground and it's just sniffing over and over again. At this point I'm like, where's my bro? It's full dark and this thing is stalking me and using cover. My buddy's light starts shining down the road and this thing crashes through the bushes away from us. Uh, at first I figure that it must be a bear but thinking back on it, I really don't know what it was to be honest. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. Whatever it was, I was turtle heading, I'm not going to lie. I had one shot in the dark, coyotes howling like crazy too. Predators were out in full effect on the full moonlight, the bull next to me and... I don't know, it was a weird night and I don't know what that thing was but... Like I said, it's like nothing I'd ever seen. So yesterday, while returning home from my work, I was exhausted and at some point I strayed from my routine way back home and I decided to sit down on a bench at a small park. The park was empty at the time and about five minutes later, a young man that I'd say he was in his late 20s to early 30s, dressed in a business suit, holding a briefcase, sat on the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on a bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? He had a British accent and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. I was surprised and thought that this was someone that I must have known from college or high school that I just didn't remember at the time. And when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then put his briefcase to his lap and clasped his hands on top of the briefcase. At this point I started to feel worried and I asked him again how he knew me but before I could finish my sentence he interrupted me and said I'll get into it in a little while but first let me ask you are you satisfied with where you're living right now and then just said my entire address. He then said what are your thoughts on your workplace are you satisfied with your wage and then he correctly stated my wage. At this point I was getting really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again and he calmly replied it doesn't matter at this point or moment I don't recall what exactly he said but right now what matters is that I want to help you. He then went on to state a lot of personal information about me that I wouldn't think anyone would ever know and he especially knew a lot about my personal relationships about people that I know. As he was saying all this stuff, I started to pack up my things and got up from the bench and asked who he was and what he wanted in a sort of worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him asking what the heck he wanted from me and who he was. And he didn't say anything and he did this very weird thing where he sort of rolled his eyes first and then slowly turned his head behind as if someone was standing behind him and just said, very well then. The way he did that was so strange though, like almost as if he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench and he started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag but he grabbed my arm and said no need for that, pushed me away and I lost my balance and fell to the ground and then he quickly walked away. Obviously, I was really scared after falling to the ground and didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way that he walked away, but I didn't see him. Which was strange because I should have been able to. It was then that I decided to just get out of the park and just go home. Overall, his mannerisms were really strange and he used his hands in a sort of elegant manner a lot when he talked. Like as if he was a theatrical actor and as I stated before, he spoke in a British accent, I live in the US, and spoke theatrically as well if that makes sense. He was tall, very well dressed, clean shaven, had short slicked hair and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had this square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and it had sort of like a little black trident on it. I obviously haven't gone to the police yet, but I do intend to, but I really don't know what to say or what evidence to provide apart from a small wound on my hand. Is there a place where I can ask for some advice about what to do about this situation? I'm a bit lost in all this and I just don't know what to think of it. Uh, 
I don't really remember this very clearly since I must have been seven or eight at the time, so I had to ask my mum for some details about this. This all started when I was at Target going back to school shopping. I was looking at some backpacks when this woman comes up to me and starts talking to me and my mum. She was asking my mum questions about me like how old I am, what grade I'm in, what school I go to, etc. She had two kids with her so my mum was a little confused why she was looking at Hello Kitty backpacks but she said that she was looking for some for her niece. My mum is feeling a little bit weird about this but mostly just brushes it off until this tall bald guy comes from the other side of the aisle and sort of blocks my mum's exits. So my mum is really getting nervous now until somebody else goes into the aisle and my mum takes that as an opportunity to leave. Cut to a year later, I'm shopping with my mum at a Coles and there's these display beds everywhere and I always like laying on every single bed as a kid anyway. I don't notice him but my mum notices a, a tall bald man staring at us while on the phone. The man never talked nor will he ever talk during the rest of our interactions but my mum tells me that it's time to get up from the bed and continue shopping and she keeps an eye on him and notices that he and a woman are just walking around the store with an empty cart not buying anything. This was in the summer and I needed new swimming goggles so I was looking at some until the man and the woman they come up to us. The woman asks do they have those goggles in adult sizes and just as they ask my mum realizes that they are the same man and woman from a year ago in Target. She says uh, no they only have kid sizes and then quickly grabbed my arm and walked away. Many years later I'm in 8th grade and I was in health class. We were in sex ed unit and we were learning about human sex traffickers and how to avoid them. I went through the lesson and nothing came to me until I was in the car with my mum driving home and I was thinking about the lesson. You see, one thing specifically stuck in my mind. My teacher said that sometimes these traffickers would have women do all the talking to make people feel more comfortable in the situation. And then I get that memory of the man and the woman. The woman talked a lot and the man didn't say a single thing. I start putting together all the pieces and noticing that they were showing the same signs the lessons were showing us. So then finally I turned to my mum who was driving and said, Mum, I think those people in the coals, they may be human traffickers. We sort of looked at each other and she nodded and said, Yeah, I think they've been following us for quite some time now. So I must think about this a couple of times a year at least and I've looked it up but I've never found anything similar. This happened a few years ago. So one night my now wife and I were driving back from Sonic. We lived in a very old very small town in West Texas. It was raining but not heavily. Puddles on the ground. Wet enough that it would be weird for someone to be walking around though. On top of that, there's a lot of roads with little or no lighting, so lots of the roads are mostly dark at night. We were driving down one such road when this happened. As my wife and I were driving, I looked to my right and I saw, well, what I can only describe to be a faceless man. Not deformed, but like actually faceless. His face was white, or really all of him looked white. He looked almost like a blur or something, and... His arms seemed impossibly long, almost down to the ground in fact, and were moving in just a really unnatural way. Arms swinging back and forth aimlessly, but also very fast. But the best that I can describe this man's movements is that he sort of looked like he was glitching. But we weren't moving fast, probably 25 miles per hour because we were in a residential area. I looked at him long enough that I had time to wonder what I was looking at before he went out of my view. For a second, I even wondered if someone was using a weed whacker or doing yard work, but of course not. I mean, it was 9pm and raining. I said nothing to my wife, assuming that my eyes must have just been playing tricks on me. I mean, it was dark, and maybe the rain blurred the window. I didn't know. But a couple of hours later, my wife asked me if I noticed the man on the side of the road that had no face. I could barely believe my ears, and... 
it's still the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. So, I'm wondering if anyone might know what this might be called, or if anyone who's had a similar experience might be willing to share it with me. I still have no idea what this was, but I'm trying really hard to find out more information, so if you can help me, I would really appreciate it. This happened three years ago when I was still in high school. My school is very far from my home, so I ride the train each day. Sometimes a friend would go with me too. We would usually encounter our classmate along with her boyfriend in front of us. We never really spoke with each other, but we know that it's them because of their size differences, her height. Our classmate is a girl and she's very small, smaller than the average small height really, and I think she's around my chest level in fact, and I'm just around 156 centimeters. She also has curly hair, which is rare in my country. Her boyfriend is tall and quite big. My friend and I would always try to walk past them on the way to the train, and we would never really greet them because we're too shy, but hey, whatever. Now one day we had a group project over at another classmate's house. That girl, the classmate, was also invited, and we started getting to know each other a bit. She told me that she thinks that I'm pretty cool and wants to be friends with me and that she would always see me entering the school at around 9 in the morning, but she's too shy to approach me. I went silent because, as far as I know, I'm always late for class. I would be at the school at around 12pm or 12.30pm, never too early. I told her that that couldn't be me, but she told me that it really was me. She told me the details of how I would get off my ride and cross the highway running like a penguin. Well, she's actually kind of right, to be honest. Everyone tells me that I ran a bit like a penguin when I have a backpack on me. She continued explaining that I wore a blue hoodie, black and yellow Adidas bag, and a huge black headphone set, so it would be easy to identify me. Now, our country has a lot of hot weather, and no one would wear stupid hoodies during the daytime except for me. I then told her about how my friend and I also saw her and her boyfriend every day after school on the way to the train station. She looked at me weirdly and told us that that wasn't them and that they actually go the opposite way. They actually don't have anything to do with that train station. Hearing that, I must admit that I got chills. I defended what I said though and I told her that it was definitely them, that she must be making it up just to, you know, have a joke with me or something. I know that her boyfriend wears white glasses and that that's also rare because I haven't seen a guy at our school who even wears the same glasses. But we started exchanging weird looks and I asked her if she's messing with me. She then texted her boyfriend and asked him about how she would always point out to him that she sees me during 9am entering the school grounds. She asked her boyfriend what I wore and he explained clearly a blue hoodie, black headphones, black yellow bag running like a penguin across the street. So, apparently, they would see me at 9 in the morning entering the school and I would see them walking to the train station at around 7pm. And, to be honest, none of this makes any sense. After our conversation happened though, those, or whatever they were, they never showed up again. Like, we tried to confirm with each other, but we, or whatever they were, were just never there again. I still think about this incident every day after years and it was the most bizarre thing that I've ever been a part of. It continued to happen until we noticed it and it just stopped after we found out about it, which is so strange. I've been with different classmates on the way to the train so I have other witnesses too and we've all confirmed that we definitely saw them. We never knew why this happened or if it was doppelgangers or what but... What would have happened to us if we approached those, well, things? A part of me says that we're lucky that we didn't approach them. Because who knows what those things are. This must have happened nearly 20 years ago now when I was five, I think. So my family lived in a trailer park and... I basically had free reign to roam around as long as I didn't actually leave the trailer park itself. One rainy day, a friend and I decided to meet at the playground in the center of the trailer park and just hang out as kids do. Usually, we would have stayed at the playground, 
but for some reason that day we felt like just walking around, seeing what kind of adventures that we could get ourselves into. This ended up being an awful idea, and the adventure was not fun in the slightest. Due to the rain, there weren't a lot of people hanging around outside that day, so the streets we were walking down were pretty much empty. At one point, a car pulls up next to us. The driver was a kind of thin guy with a moustache. In the passenger seat was a much bigger, bold man. They both looked old enough to be my dad. The driver rolls down his window, though, and looks us up and down. Are you kids a little young to be walking around by yourselves? He said. I should uh, probably preface this by saying that, at this point in time, I hadn't quite grasped the concept of stranger danger yet. I obviously smiled at him and replied, Nope, my mum says I can go anywhere I want in the park. My friend kicked me and when I shot around to ask her what her problem was, she had a serious look on her face and was shaking her head no. Luckily, my friend was way smarter than me at that age and did already have a, a bit of a handle on the concept of stranger danger. The driver continues, Well, you might get sick if you stay out in this rain too long, but why don't you let us give you a ride home? My friend shook her head at the man. Uh, no thank you. She then proceeded to grab my hand and started pulling me away, moving ever so slightly faster than our previous pace. The car slowly crept next to us, the driver not giving up that easily. Really? I insist. I wouldn't want you guys to catch a cold or something. My friend kept pulling me forward and, without even looking at him, replied in a slightly firmer tone. No thank you, we're fine. She started walking even faster me finally picking up on her energy and matching my pace to hers. Then we heard a car door open. I took a quick glance back and saw that the larger man, who hadn't said a word at this point, was getting out of the car. My panic mode kicked in and I shouted run as I turned to start running through the grass and in between people's trailers. I heard my friend running directly behind me too. We didn't have any idea where we were running to, we just knew that we had to get away from those men. After a bit, we saw her teenage cousin's trailer. We sprinted to it and burst through the door. Luckily, they were home and it was unlocked. We locked the door behind us and frantically looked out the windows, breathing a sigh of relief as we saw no sign of the men or their car. The friend's cousin ran into the room and, upon seeing us breathing heavily and clutching our chests, asked us what the heck was going on. My friend told her everything that happened and she told us to sit down on the couch and relax a bit just happy that we were okay. We ended up staying there for a few hours, I think watching Disney movies. Her cousin then drove us to our respective homes, telling us that she doesn't want us walking around without a grown-up or a bigger kid like her anymore, and I had absolutely no protest to that after this experience. I never did see those two men again, and really, I don't think that they were from this area at all. And at the age of 23, I still sometimes lose sleep wondering... What would have happened if my friend hadn't been so smart that day, or if we hadn't been able to outrun that guy? I shudder to think what would have happened to us. So this takes place when I was around 17 and living with my parents. It was the weekend and I was chilling in my room while my parents were out grocery shopping. When I was home alone, I always made sure to lock the door, including a lock that could only be unlocked from the inside, which made me feel extra safe. And due to that, when I heard the keys in the lock, I knew that it was my parents, and I immediately opened the door for them. At first, I used to look through the peephole to make sure that it was them, but I just stopped after a while, and I just assumed that it was them. Well, that day my parents came back early, and as usual, I opened the door for them after hearing the keys in the door. And maybe 20 minutes after they came back, I was in my room when I heard a noise coming from the front door. I went to investigate and it sounded like someone was inserting something in the lock or trying to open the door with the wrong keys or something. I immediately warned my dad who went to open the door and we saw a man, he seemed to be in his 40s, trying to open the door. My dad at first thought that it was a confused neighbor and told him that he got the wrong apartment but the man didn't answer just stood there with a blank expression staring at me. His whole demeanor gave me a bad feeling and I told my dad to stop talking and close the door. After standing there for a few seconds not responding, the man ran down the stairs, even though there is an elevator, and left the building. 
My dad was amused by the whole thing and I just went back to what I was doing. But thinking back on it later in the day, I realized that if my parents came back just 20 minutes later, I would have rushed to open this door to this man thinking that it was them. He obviously wasn't a confused neighbor since I never saw him in the building before and his reaction was really odd as well. I also realized that by taking the stairs, he avoided being seen by the camera facing the elevator. So this guy must have been scoping out the place and he also must have known that by just trying the door like he did, that I would have opened it. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well that night and I always checked before opening the door after that. So I'm sharing this because I would like to get more insight as to what was going on. I, male, was five years old, so this was 42 years ago now, and I didn't know anything about the paranormal back in those days. My mum was going into labour with my younger brother, so mum and dad had me stay at my grandparents for a couple of days, and it happened over Christmas. Christmas morning was great. I still remember their silver vintage aluminum Christmas tree and the Crayola caddy that I unwrapped and had so wanted for so long. But that night though, something strange and really terrifying happened. You see, I shared a, a queen bed with my grandfather. Side note, there were two bedrooms and my grandparents already slept in separate rooms for years because of snoring. I was woken in the middle of the night to the bed violently shaking to give you a sense of the intensity, imagine the four legs of the bed were each sitting in industrial paint can mixes, synced up, turned on high. I had no idea what was going on, but I was scared to death. My grandfather, however, was still sleeping through all of this somehow. I tried desperately to shake him awake. Finally, he started to stir awake and instantly the bed stopped still. I asked him, Grandpa, what was making the bed shake? Why was the bed shaking? Groggily, he had no idea what I was talking about and said, The bed's not shaking, go back to sleep. He turned back over and was snoring again in seconds. My adrenaline was completely jacked up and there was no way that I was falling back asleep anytime soon. So I just sat there, in the dark, in the silence, waiting. There was ambient light from the outside that dimly lit the room. The bedroom door was open, which it normally was anyway. And at the foot of the bed, you could look out the bedroom doorway, down the hall, and into the front room where the Christmas tree was. I sat up at the edge of the bed to look at the tree, and as little kids, Christmas trees give a sense of comfort, I guess. As I looked at the tree, probably 30 feet away, I could see that something was different. Now sitting beside the tree was the silhouette or shadow shape of what I can only describe as an absolutely enormous Doberman dog. And by huge, I mean sitting on its haunches, it still had to be well over five feet tall. It just seemed to sit there and stare at me. No movement, no sound. And although I didn't get the sense that it was trying to get me, boy did it scare me. I hid under the covers and eventually I fell asleep and I woke up to a, a beautiful sunny winter morning. Now, nothing paranormal ever happened in that house again after this, to my knowledge at least. However, my grandfather would certainly turn out to be a complete monster. I'll spare you all the details, but it was incredibly abusive and it was terrible. Both of those grandparents have long since passed on and I often wonder if there was a connection between these demonic or poltergeist or whatever you want to call it activity and him. Did the activity cause him to act awful to people, or was he already a terrible person, somehow unknowingly manifesting the activity himself? And while I know it's a long shot, if you have insight into beds violently shaking like this, or huge dark shadows of dogs, I'd appreciate any feedback. To note too, this occurred likely right when my brother was actually being born a, a mile or two away, 3am, local, December 26, 1980. And maybe six hours after the Rendlesham forest incident that happened thousands of miles away in England. I'm unsure if these events are purely coincidental, but I just thought that I should mention them. So, I'll just get straight to it. 
uh, around Monday or Tuesday of this week, I was sitting at my desk picking up my PlayStation controller as I had previously set it down. I looked over slightly and I saw something that appeared to be like a, a grey fog-like creature's head that was peeking out from under my desk that had pitch black where its eyes should be and a long stretched mouth, black as well. Of course, I reacted like any sane person and yelled and sort of jumped back. My brother asked me what was wrong and I tried to tell him that I just saw a face, but he didn't believe me. After that, nothing really happened besides when I would close my eyes and sleep, I would see a person burning. I could vividly see them grabbing at their face and it isn't lifelike though, it's sort of like a drawing, I guess. It's been happening every time that I close my eyes to sleep, like I said. Thursday of this week, I was trying to sleep again. I was restless, so I rolled over to see if there was anything going on in the room. And I looked to my door, keep in mind my lights are off, and see a tall jet black figure who can barely fit in my doorway. Average doorway, mind you. The thing was very skinny. It looked like it was studying me, like I was a creature to be watched in a petting zoo or something. The creature looked like it was moving its head around, but I couldn't see it well because it didn't have any facial features and my room was dark. But whenever I saw it, I locked eyes with it for like 10 to 15 seconds and I rubbed my eyes to make sure that I wasn't seeing things. And the creature started to, well, it seemed like chuckle. Its arms grabbed at its sides as if it was the funniest joke that it's ever seen. But it didn't make any sound. I turn over and turn back to it and... When I did, it was still there. It didn't leave. I yelled at my brother to turn on the lights, but of course I took my eyes off the thing to look at my brother, but as soon as I turned back to whatever this thing was, it had vanished. I tried to play it off cool and acted like I wanted to go into the closet and change into more comfortable clothes. I did, and then I went back to try to go to sleep, and that night, I refused to look at that door again. When my brother was six and I was four, we moved house at some point. My brother remembers that the first night that we slept there, he had trouble getting to sleep and his eyes kept focusing on something in his room that looked like the outline of a person standing at the foot of his bed. He says the next morning, I said that there had been a wiggly man in my room that night. I don't remember this myself, and our parents don't remember me saying it too, but there were lots of experiences that I had in that house over the years that I do remember vividly. Like, I would hear voices, usually angry ones, and often my brother would hear the same thing at the same time, but our parents, they wouldn't hear anything. We both used to feel hands grabbing at us, especially at night. We both got sleep paralysis often, and we both would see a, a pale, sick-looking man with sores around his eyes, nose, and mouth holding us down. We both heard footsteps patrolling the house at night, I saw a woman in an old-fashioned dress sort of sitting or lying at the bottom of the staircase and crying three different times. And one of those times, my brother also saw her. I would hear loud banging on the bedroom door. At first, I assumed it was my brother being a, a terrible person, but when I went to check, there was never anyone there. My brother would often hear the banging too, but our parents never did. My brother was seeing and hearing strange things almost every week. There was always weirdness like doors, cupboards and drawers being left open when we knew that we closed them. We had smells and problems with electronics. Our parents constantly got people in to check for problems too, with the wiring or CO2 etc. Stuff got knocked over though when there was nobody around and our parents never believed us about what we saw and heard. No one did in fact. At first, everyone thought that my brother was making it up and I was playing along to be included. Then they thought that he was having psychosis symptoms and because I was young and suggestible, I was imagining the things that he was saying that he saw. I was actually starting to believe this theory too until my brother and I saw a shadow person walk through the coffee table towards us and the coffee table moved too. The remote fell off of it and a glass on it fell off and chipped. That was 100% real because afterwards... That cup was still chipped, that coffee table had definitely moved, and the remote remained on the ground for a long time afterward. Our parents could see it too, and we actually got in trouble for it. 
That one definitely couldn't have been a hallucination or imagination for sure. We moved out after six years there and we stopped seeing and hearing those things after that. No more sleep paralysis. Everyone thought that my brother's psychosis was being controlled by meds or something, but when we moved out of our home, he stopped taking these meds and he was fine. No symptoms of psychosis or anything. We both agree that the house was definitely haunted, but our parents still stick with the psychosis theory and we've learned not to bother arguing about it because it will never change their mind. I'm a woman in my 30s caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I need it to be cool to sleep, and I haven't really worried too much about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, but I can reach to open and close it pretty quickly but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in as well. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in my room with me. But while she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog, who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she is a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So, with these things in mind, I've never really worried about opening the window and leaving it open. But after tonight... I will not be doing that again. So it started at maybe 3.30 or 4 in the morning sometime. I was awake since I care for my parents like I said. I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours anyway. I was reading a book and I heard Sable growl low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window, before jumping up to the cabinet by the window barking. I shouted, Hey, we're calling the police, dog will bite just in case there was somebody there and went to look out at the curtains to the side, but I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too, tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then, I mean... It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by our neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark as well. But she doesn't usually react the way that she did this time. She usually growls, but stays on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the open window to potentially burgle, they would have seen now that the room was occupied by a person and a dog, and would go find an easier target. But mainly I guess that it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or maybe later, after I had relaxed and thought that I might doze off soon, that I heard her growl again. It was a really serious deep and low growl again and I listened, again thinking that it might be foxes or something. But this time, I heard what sounded like deep horror movie breathing noises like the heavy breathing sounds a pervert makes down the phone to his stalking victim in a film or something. I sat up, looked up at the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone was peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted, hey, again, and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain, and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and exit of the front garden. It was too dark to make out features or clothing. It was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew that he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called the emergency services. But one thing that creeps me out most is that, in hindsight, that would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window and that was after I'd shouted and he knew that I'd seen him. But he must have stayed there even knowing that I'd seen. Until I moved the curtain and could see out. Only then did he move away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. Because it was so loud. Like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police I went around the ground floor of the house turning the lights on. Making sure the rest of the house was still secure and it was. 
I was very careful to lock the doors and all the other windows at night and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5am and they took the report. They suggested asking the neighbours if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow as well. And they went to drive around the area saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5am, the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant that I only saw the shape of a person, I didn't really have a description. I doubt that they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain that it was a man if I'm being honest, but the breathing and the figure that I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap. And the height, I would guess would have been average, 5'8 to 5'10. But I'm feeling really shaken by the whole thing, really angry too and violated and wishing that I had installed cameras now. We will be looking into that for sure. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. I don't have any enemies or recent exes. No one that I know of harboring any grudges. Since I'm caring for my folks full time now as well, I'm not out socializing or making enemies or anything. Nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I'm at the wrong side of 35 and living in jeans and joggers and t-shirts. No makeup or fussing with hair most of the time, so not likely a target for a peeping Tom pervert. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was my dog who alerted me to something both times, I would have wondered whether I was half asleep and just dreamt it. That I had just imagined it. I have had hallucinations once as the result of a bad reaction to an antidepressant, but that was more than a decade ago now. Hasn't happened before or since then, and... I learned how to test my reality in times I was worried about whether something really happened or not from a psychologist. When I asked how I could ever trust my own senses again after that reaction to the meds, that is. They said that to be sure something was real, to see if other people can see or hear the thing too, or if it's a noise or voice outside, can I see someone or something that explains the noise? If so, then it's probably not a hallucination if both oral and visual perceptions match up. The dog sensed someone there first though, and I heard and then saw someone as well. I definitely wasn't dreaming or imagining it. I don't use drugs and almost never drink. I'm scientifically minded and I don't really believe in ghosts, and while I love a good horror film, I'm rarely freaked out by them anymore. Too old and too cynical, I guess. And all that's to say that I have to think that it was someone who was looking to burgle a house. But for the fact that they came back so much later... Maybe someone was on drugs or having a mental health episode? Or, and this one probably bothers me the most, someone who wanted to actually scare me. But why and who? How do they know where we live? Are they going to come back? And new fears keep popping up into my head and like most nights, I'm up at some point late at night or in the very early hours and will let the dog outside into the back garden for a quick pee and... I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to attack and gain entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back garden with only a small side gate as well, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out, and it would be easy for someone to access this, then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view. Whoever they were though, they were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in that room. Perhaps hoping that I would have fallen asleep by then? They seem to be trying to deliberately scare me though when they return the second time. Doing that deep breathing noise and staying by the window even after I'd shouted. In those few seconds that it would have taken from me shouting out until I reached the window and could move the curtains and see out, they could have moved and been long out of sight. But they chose to stay there until there was a chance that I could see them, only then moving away. The breathing noises and then the coldness that ran through me when I actually saw a man moving away from the window, that, I think, is going to haunt me for some time now. Along with the question of their motives, were they trying to scare me? Why? What's to stop them coming back? And if they weren't just trying to scare me, what were they trying to do? Me and my boyfriend, we absolutely adore hiking, and there are so many places to go because of where we live in Oregon. And one day, we decided to go hiking after 11pm at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We have both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and 
Neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail, and even though there was a fire, the path was actually very clean and stable. So we started walking up the trail when we just started talking about paranormal things like witchcraft and wendigos and stuff like that. Terrible move on our side, talking about things of that sort when you're hiking at night. But anyway, it should be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones too, and we were both very observant as to where we were on the path. But like I said, we know this place too. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we were now all of a sudden not on a trail anymore or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like instantly in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden I remember walking on the trail and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking but thankfully he said no because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. And I truly believe that if we had tried backtracking... I don't think that I would be writing this. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill and thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down terrified and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. There's just no way that we should have been where we were. Anyway, we eventually made it back, but I just wanted to share this experience because it was weird and I still have no explanation for it. If anyone has any opinion, then please do let me know because this one has me stumped. This happened about six years ago in 2016. I was 18 at the time, had moved back to Portland, Oregon for college as an escape from the 8 year old hellhole that was my life in San Diego, California. I grew up with a single mum most of my life so I moved around a lot. I'd lived in Vancouver, Washington, the greater Portland area for a few years prior to moving to San Diego. So when I needed an escape to leave SoCal, as soon as I graduated, going to college out of state was really the only option. I applied to Portland State University two weeks prior to the submission deadline, and I of course got in. I arrived to Portland a good six weeks prior to school starting since I had some academic programs that I got in that required an earlier presence to establish some ground before school started and all that. So there I was, 18 years old, returning nostalgically to what I called home, living in the Broadway freshman student housing, and... I took in my sense of freedom by going on late night walks around the, the park blocks to Rocket Fears or Voodoo Donut, just about anywhere that I could. Now that I've listened to true crime podcasts, watched a lot of true crime since I was in elementary school, thanks to my ex-sheriff mum who told jail stories for bedtime, I should have known better than to do what I did, I know that. I was notorious among my friends though for the style that I adopted, even in the autumn weather Portland has. I would wear a long XXL shirt, no pants, sneakers, and a clear transparent bag. Yes, where you can clearly see my wallet, and that I also had a weapon everywhere that I went. Even on my 11pm to 4am walks alone, I still wore something like this. This story is about one of those lonesome late night walks too. I found a decent parking garage that I would walk to most nights, near SW 6th and Jefferson in downtown. I would chain smoke into the night, and no issues on any situation, except for this one night. It was about 1am or 2am at this time I would guess. I was heading back to my dorm room, slightly tipsy. I had passed my friends up on a party at University Point that day, so all of my immediate contacts were inebriated at a party not too far from where I was. I found myself walking down 6th Avenue alone. It was eerie too given that it was a Saturday night. There was not a car or a person in sight and 
I had both headphones in, focusing on not feeling coldness and heading home. When suddenly, a, a car speeds up to where I am. Two men hop out, and both go on each side of me. I pause my music and act as if I'm not freaked out. I am visibly intoxicated and probably smell faded too. And let me also mention that at this point in my life, I had shaved my head, pretty much bald, was about 135 pounds, and wore large shirts like I said. I could have been a pantless male for all they could have known. But they said, hey, how are you? Where are you headed? You seem a bit drunk. I shoot the guy on my left daggers as much as I can while all the while trying to assure myself that I can still walk straight. I'm just trying to make it home tonight, I say back. The guy on the right says, well, we can help, but we can take you to your home. Where's home at? I ignore him and I keep my pace. I didn't believe in God then, but was praying in my head that I made it home that night, promising whoever I was praying to that I wouldn't be this stupid being out late again, alone, under the influence. Both give each other a look, and they start walking slower, now following behind me. I keep my pace and calculate how far I am, where my resident hall key was, and how fast I could possibly run while making it to the building without being caught by the two men on foot, or their accomplices in the car. But before I could mentally provide myself those answers, the car screeches back and they all of a sudden hop in and speed off. I count my lucky stars that this happened while running back. I head to Max, it's a, a liquor store me and the gang used to chain smoke at. I call campus security and relay all the stuff that just happened to them and to my horror, I'm told that I'm the 13th call with such a report that week. I head back inside to my dorm, awaiting my friends to tell them what had just occurred. Oh, but the story doesn't end there. You see, fast forward to July 2017, and I dropped out of college by the first semester. I went back to San Diego for a few months and officially moved me and my family all up to Portland. We were pretty settled in our cozy apartment where well, we were watching the news one night. And my heart sank to my stomach and... I felt like I was about to vomit, because there on the news, a sex trafficking ring in the next city over was busted. Quite a few faces had been shown as to who was arrested, but they were mostly women, which was interesting, with only a handful of men shown. But I did recognize two of the faces there, the two being the men from that night. Yes. I was tipsy, and yes, I was a little bit high, but I knew that those faces were theirs for sure. I called the PPD, and I provided them with the information, with them verifying some call-ins around the same time period of mine were how some of the members chose to abduct. Why they didn't abduct me, I'll never know. All I know is that I'm grateful. I'm grateful that they didn't take me. I'm grateful that I ran when I did, and I'm grateful that they were caught. So around July or August of 2021, my city was under its second major lockdown where you were not allowed to have any guests over at your house and stuff like that. I had just moved back in with my parents in early July after my lease ended, and I didn't renew it. I'm in my mid-twenties, my mother was a big stickler for the COVID laws, so my girlfriend was not even allowed on my big front porch. <laughs> it was really annoying. But anyway, the girlfriend and I would often go for walks around a local creek near my house, and we were a fresh couple, so we had certain, well, let's say, needs if you catch my drift. There was a hidden side path attached to the main walkway that goes through the creek that we would sneak off into to relieve ourselves. Yeah, I know, it's a bit messed up, but... One night at about 7pm, it's winter time, so it's pitch black in this creek after about 5.30. We decided to walk to our spot, and my girlfriend was excited and decided to skip ahead of me. I was walking slowly while she was about 7 metres ahead. Once I turned the corner into the side area... I noticed that she was on her phone and she was acting, well, weird, checking the weather and other apps and randomly said, okay, it's time for me to go home now. I was just sort of like, 
Oh, okay. She doesn't want to do it anymore, I guess. No worries. But as we started walking away, she whispers, There's someone right behind you. And I'm like, what? So I turn my head over my right shoulder and, sure enough, that was a man in all black with his hoodie on, squatting and hiding in the bushes, just sort of staring at us. Where this bush is was on the top of a ledge about uh, three or four feet above the path, so while the man in black was squatting or crouching, our faces were basically aligned. I immediately said, what the heck? I was pretty caught off guard, so I said it weakly, and this man just didn't react at all. He didn't gasp, say hello, or excuse me, or any of the usual things a person would say if people notice each other like that, in the pitch black woods of all places. He just stared at us as we slowly walked away. I asked my girlfriend how she even noticed him, and... She said that when she walked down the trail before I got there, she saw the man on his phone and as soon as she arrived, the man in the hoodie turned his phone off. We left that walkway and went up one sort of close by. Yeah, we're idiots, I know. And as we're walking up the parallel side trail, we could see the man still hiding in the bushes staring at us. And there was only a faint light from the moon that night, but you could definitely still see him. It was a, a really creepy and unexplained event. But we never really went back there and we never intend to either. About seven years ago, during the time that I was in college, I was around 20 years old. I was highly stressed being a, a biology major. I'd fallen asleep with my office chair facing me my desk light was still on, and at some point I woke up during the sleep, and I was having sleep paralysis, unable to move my body, and what I saw sitting on my chair was the most vivid, detailed, and scary creature that I have ever seen in my life. I still remember it to this day. The light was still shining in the background. The creature was about three to four feet tall. It looked like an emaciated old woman, fragile, grey pale skin and very thin as well. The nose was narrow, sharp and big. The eyes were black and dark. But there were no whites around the eyes. The hair was very brittle, thin and grey. The hands were old, thin, bony, long fingers and the nails were so long. I would say about one to one and a half inches in length. The nails on the foot and hands were not trimmed as if they hadn't been cut. Her ears were pointy and sharp. It looked sort of like an elf, I guess, but she had a really small chin. She wore an old ragged white dress with cut out small triangular patterns. During the sleep paralysis, I stared at her for a good two minutes or so. She stared back at me. She didn't go on my chest or anything as is typical of this sort of thing. And I didn't feel suffocated during the experience. I couldn't scream or move, and the thing never smiled or had any facial expressions. It was just completely blank and staring at me. What really freaked me out after the sleep paralysis experience, though, was that I searched up Old Hag and found that other people have had similar experiences with the Old Hag. It was a really crazy sleep paralysis experience. I've never had an experience like this again, and... I never placed an office chair facing me. I felt like it was an invitation to watch me. It was wicked and it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Especially because when I woke up, I could have sworn that the chair had moved. My parents, they introduced me to a murderer. Well, a man capable of murder anyway, and we just didn't know it yet. He was a down-to-earth stoner, with three kids and another on the way, with a super sweet wife who was a, a little bit crazy, I guess. He came over, would tell my parents everything going on in his life, then disappear for a few days. He always came back with some crazy stories, but never would assume anything bad about him from them. 
He'd tell us how his wife stabbed him in the foot at one point, how the kids dug a hole in their trailer, that his mother-in-law was psycho and once he came over on the run for having a gun at his mother-in-law's. He was there and gone in like five minutes. I regularly check our state circuit court and the dude was never in legal trouble when I looked him up, so I assumed that he just had family issues and maybe a couple of screws loose. But the last time that I saw him, he came over and smoked with my mum and my girl, told us how excited he was for this baby in the way and, and hoped that he looked more like him than the last one who was a clone of his mama. We all hung out together outside and drove the kids around in the ATV, just messing about, about our pasts and our futures and whatnot. He was hopeful. Not a bone in his body said aggressive. He was very empathic, very family orientated, and just really kind all around, I guess. But then, then he went missing for two weeks. And not a peep from him or his wife. We then see his picture on the news with... The title, Murderer, takes his own life with his name attached. He apparently killed someone, took his body and dumped it. And when the police tried talking to him while he was in his car, he turned, looked at the police and, well, ended his own life. I'm really confused and we'll never really hear the full story, I guess. Two dead men, no closure for anyone. But because of this man, I think that I'll forever wonder who else I know that is capable of murder. So before I start this, I just want to say that we are that couple in a horror movie. My boyfriend and I, we've been together for a year now and we've recently found out that I was pregnant with our first baby. After we found out, we decided that we needed to get our lives together and buy our first house and move in together. After a few months of searching for our perfect home, we found one in the market, in our price range, just begging for us to buy it, with the previous owners keen to sell it to us as soon as possible. Now, growing up, I've always been aware of spirits and stuff, not seeing them or anything, but I would feel things and hear typical things when things were quiet. It was common for me growing up. My boyfriend is the same, but he often saw them while growing up and has always been scared of his gift, so he tries to block it out most of the time. After moving in, I started to feel a, a presence, I guess you could say, often while I was home alone, especially in the mornings or late at night. It's not a, a nice presence. I would always get the feeling of absolute dread. I would get too scared to move, or my muscles would go tight, and... I feel like I might have had a panic attack at one stage, but as fast as it's brought on, it also leaves that quickly as well, leaving me a little bit shaken. I mostly get this feeling down one end of the house that I don't really go down very often, or in the baby's room in the walk-in robe, which I can't go in without turning the light on straight away. My boyfriend has also said in the mornings when he comes home alone, I leave for work at 5 in the morning and he doesn't leave until 7, that he would get the feeling that he's just not alone and often rushes out the door due to a, a feeling of uneasiness. Only recently have we both really confided in each other about the scary feelings that we get while home alone, and I feel since we've been talking about our experiences, the more frequent they're becoming. Like the other night... I woke up at around 1.30 in the morning, which I now do frequently, but has only become a thing since moving into this house. I laid there for a bit and listened to my boyfriend grinding his teeth, wishing that he'd be quiet when the feeling of dread just hit me so unexpectedly and sudden that I couldn't move. I felt my heartbeat racing in my chest. I went freezing cold and I was too scared to even open my eyes. I could have sworn too that... Someone was pacing around the bed, walking from my boyfriend's side to my side, and then back again. Eventually, after what felt like hours, but it was probably only minutes, it stopped at the end of the bed. I know, cliche horror stuff. I eventually got the courage, though, to open my eyes, and again, I could have sworn that I saw the silhouette of someone at the end of the bed. I immediately picked up my phone, switched the torch on, and... You already know how this ends, right? Nothing was there. 
So I left my torch on for a bit and cuddled into my boyfriend, who was still asleep, to calm myself down a bit and then I turned the light off and went back to sleep, no dramas, got up at 5am and headed to work. But after I left my boyfriend that morning, he told me that he had a horrible nightmare that was set in the house and someone was trying to drown him when he woke up, he felt like someone was pulling on his legs and when he kicked out, he felt like he'd actually kick someone. He quickly sat up and, again, nobody was there. He said that he's never gotten ready for work quicker in his life and he was also an hour early. So yeah, we are that couple in a horror movie at the moment that bought a haunted house. We're currently looking into cleansing our home to get rid of whatever this is. But we are straight up not having a good time and if anyone has any suggestions on how to remove something like this, that would be great. I've been thinking about a, a weird thing that happened in my life some years ago. I felt like sharing it and I mean, maybe somebody else has experienced something like this or can explain it to me. I'll start by saying that uh, I'm really not a believer in the paranormal. I am a Christian, but uh, I hardly believe in the demonic or angelic experiences. They're rare, if anything. I feel that they're far too rare for average people to experience and can be explained away by science majority of the time. Anyway, this happened probably about six years ago now. I'm 23, and I believe this happened when I was around 16 or 17. I lived with my mother, abusive stepfather, my younger sister, and my baby brother. I lived in the basement of the house just to get away from everything. It was really my only escape. It muffled the arguing and the fighting, that sort of thing, so it's where I opted to stay for most of the time. For anyone curious, my parents are affluent, or in other words, rich, and my stepfather had an influence in the community. CPS didn't care and the cops didn't care. Many times we called the cops and many times CPS were called. Teachers and counsellors and doctors were told. But nothing was ever really done about it. So it just got to the point where we stopped reporting anything and just lived in our own hell. One night though, after hours and hours of fighting and screaming and banging, I don't even know what was exactly happening. Neither of my siblings knew either. We are all the avoidant types. If we can stay out of the fight to avoid being hurt ourselves, and we did... But the house just suddenly went silent. It was a relief at first. I mean, I could finally go to bed, right? It was well after midnight at this point, and I had school to attend to in a few hours. As I was drifting off to sleep, that was when I heard a blood-curdling scream from my mum. It was so loud from the upstairs of the house that I could hear it at the basement. I immediately ran out of the room. I thought that she was being murdered or something. My one dog was throwing herself down the basement steps to get away as I was running the opposite direction up the stairs. I've never really run so fast to get upstairs before. Running through the kitchen and living room to get up to her as well. Me and my siblings met each other outside of her bedroom door to hear her vomiting profusely in the master bedroom. I broke down the door to the bathroom and saw her over the toilet throwing up everything that she had. I asked her what was wrong and she just refused to answer me. I noticed my stepfather was nowhere to be seen. My sister told me that he had left the house and drove off. My brother was crying at this point and my sister was shaking. Really, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept asking her what she needed, but she wouldn't even talk to me. She would just throw up and sit staring into the toilet. Eventually, my brother ran crying into my mum's bedroom and climbed into her bed. My other dog already in bed too, so he climbed on top of her and hugged her. My mum got up and walked past me into the bedroom after him. All the lights were off in her room, so as she walked, she turned them all on. I followed after my mother while my sister said that she was exhausted, but stood in the doorway and didn't move to go anywhere, just sort of watching us. I went to ask my mother for the hundredth time what the heck was going on, when she cut me off and said that she saw something evil. I joked and said, was it and my stepdad's name. She got mad and told me to just shut up and listen. My mother pointed up at the skylight into the ceiling. 
It was bright and I could see the moon in the clouds. And she said that she saw a pitch black figure crawl across the ceiling. I didn't believe her. I told her that it must just be her imagination. She was still running on adrenaline and that she was just upset and needed to go to bed. She screamed at me at this point, furious, saying that her imagination would never run so wild that she'd find herself throwing up over it. I told her that her stomach was probably just upset anyhow and that's why she threw up. She told me that she didn't care what I thought, so I just said, okay, well, I'm going off to bed myself, good night, that sort of thing, and turned off the lights for her. She was in bed with my brother, so I didn't see a reason on leaving them on when I was leaving the room anyway. But when I did, she shrieked at me to turn the lights back on. So I did. Stunned, I turned around and I asked why. She was quiet before telling me that she didn't want to sleep in the dark. I don't know why this upset me, but I got mad and argumentative with her. That she didn't see anything, that is. That she was fine and everybody just needed to go to sleep. I turned off the lights and shined my phone's flashlight up at the skylight and showed her nothing was there. Everything was fine. I turned to her while I was still holding the light up to gesture to her that she was just being irrational. And my sister in the hallway, and she screamed, pointing and wailing at the skylight. I looked up and I still saw nothing. I told my sister to be quiet that she was making things worse and she started yelling back at me that something was there. Something was on top of the skylight but now it was gone. My mum then told my sister to get into bed with her so she did. All three of them sat in the bed together huddled up. I stood there staring just confused. What were they all seeing that I couldn't? Then my brother screamed. The curtain that was covering the windows across them flew back and at that I turned around. But once again there was nothing. While it was odd that the curtains were flung open, nothing was out on the deck. Nothing was outside at all. But he was adamant that something was out there. I was even more angry at this point. I told them to stop acting so crazy, that there are far worse real things going on right now, and while everyone is screaming demon, my mother's husband could come back at any moment and make things actually scary. My mother told me to turn the lights back on and to get the heck out of her room, so I did. I slammed a door behind me and I went downstairs. I do remember vividly checking out the front door's windows to make sure my sister was right, that my stepfather was really gone and sure enough his truck wasn't there. I was angry and tired so in the end I just went back down to my room and tried to get some sleep. When I got down there my 200 pound English Mastiff was in my bed hiding her head in my pillows. I walked up to her and rubbed her back and at that point, she turned back and snapped her teeth at me. I was shocked. I mean, this was not like her behavior towards me at all. Like, ever. I was mad, though, and told her to get down, and so she did. She got out of the bed and laid down beside it. I hopped into bed, and I went to go back to sleep. But that was when I felt it. I felt, and I know for sure, two pairs of hands gliding across my back at the exact same time that my dog started barking furiously. I jumped out of bed, turned on all the lights, but when I did, there was nothing. Nothing was there. I opened the curtains and looked outside, but still, nothing. I remember at this point shaking so bad, and my dog just kept growling in my general direction. And I mean, what do you do in that situation other than just run? So I grabbed my dog's collar and pulled us both out of my room. I ran upstairs with her following after me. I turned on every light as I ran. I ran through the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room all over again and kept turning on the lights as I went. I got upstairs to my mum's room. All the lights were still on and her door was closed, but I opened it and went in, my dog following after me. I didn't say anything. I climbed into bed with them and my dog jumped up after me. All four of us slept in her queen-size bed with our two dogs that night. I didn't sleep though. My mum called us all out of school the next morning. My stepfather didn't come home until days later. And I've never had a paranormal experience since then. The problems, they continued. 
And to be honest, I don't know what to think of this all these years later. I've told people this story a few times and every time no one has any sort of explanation for me. I'm not sure if anyone has a good way to explain what happened or maybe ease my mind or if you even had a similar experience growing up in an abusive home or something. I don't know, but that, that's my terrible story. To ease your minds about my situation and my sibling situations, my sister and brother still live with my mother and stepfather while well, I no longer do. I moved out three years ago. But oddly enough, my mother's husband has mellowed out in his old age. Both my siblings have said that he no longer fights like he used to. He's just petty and toxic, but not physically abusive like he used to be. He's not a good person to live with, but he's no longer targeting anyone, which is good. He just works long hours and doesn't come home until late. And my mum works long hours and works opposite schedules with him, so they rarely see each other. It's not a fun situation by any means, but at least everyone's safe, right? Well, at least according to them. If you made it this far, then thanks for listening. I'm going to try not to think about this situation too much now, but... Anyway, if you've got any information or if you know anything about this, then... I would love to hear it. A few years back, my family and I went to stay at a beach house in Clearwater, Florida. The house is rented indefinitely by my husband's rich uncle. It's three stories with two master bedrooms on the middle floor and two bedrooms on the top floor. My husband's parents stayed in a master on the middle floor and my husband and I stayed upstairs to be next to our four-year-old daughter. Now, the morning after our first night there, my mother-in-law asked, did you guys hear someone banging on the door at like 3am? Well, we didn't. She described it as being very loud and continued for some time. I thought that it was strange that she heard that and just stayed in bed and didn't wake anyone else or check it or anything. You have to walk up a large wooden staircase to get up to the front door. And I mean, why would someone be at our door at like 3 in the morning? What if they needed help? Personally, it would have scared me, I think, but she was from a different generation, so whatever, I guess. I didn't think about this conversation for a long time again, in fact. It was a while before I remembered that it took place and realized that it was actually relevant to what I experienced. You see, at some point in my trip, my husband and my mother-in-law decided to rent bikes and go for a ride. My father-in-law took my daughter outside to play on the beach and I had the house to myself. My plan was to sit on the couch in the living room and just relax and read a book. It was a beautiful room with floor-to-ceiling windows to view the ocean. However, the wall to my left was a wall of doors, a closet, a, a laundry room, and a bathroom. I hadn't been reading my book long when I heard like a, a thud three times from the direction of the doors. You know the sound that it makes when you hit a hollow door? It's different from hitting something solid and doors tend to have some wiggle room in the frame so you can hear it shake just a bit. Well, I didn't think too much about it. I mean, houses make really weird noises sometimes, right? Maybe it was the dryer, maybe a mouse or something. No big deal. But it happened again and still no big deal. I returned to my book. But it kept happening. The thuds were sort of frantic. There was no real pattern or measurable distance of time between the thuds. And so finally, I decided to get up. I was a little bit scared, so I stared towards the doors. Eventually, I was so scared that I moved to the sliding door that led to the balcony and beach access. I really didn't know what to think. I mean, what could possibly be hitting the door that much? At this point, it wasn't just a fluke. I didn't think it was an animal either. It wasn't the dryer, so what if someone was actually in there? I called my father-in-law and told him that I'm scared and need him to come and check it. He packed up my daughter and came back to find me on the balcony, too afraid to go back inside. I explained what was happening. He went inside to check things out, and of course the banging had stopped as soon as he arrived, so he didn't experience it. He checked all three rooms and found nothing that could have caused the noise, and in the end, there just was no explanation. The rest of the trip went smoothly and nobody reported any strange noises after that. I didn't spend any time alone in the house after that though, so 
I really don't know what those noises were. I am interested in the paranormal, but I don't really believe anything, I guess. I have to experience it myself, and even then, it has to be completely undeniable. But this wasn't undeniable for me by any means. Part of me still thinks that there must have been some sort of an explanation. It's really the only weird and unexplained story that I have in my life, and as I've thought about it, I don't know, it just seems like something was really off. My mum passed away three weeks ago, and I don't know, I guess I find myself revisiting the memory because I so wish to believe that there's something beyond this. My friend likes to go mushroom foraging, and one time she brought me with her. We got further and further into the woods, getting distracted by cool rocks or different mushrooms, or even just by talking. We were having a great time, just the two of us, until we stumbled into a clearing where there was a, a man sitting, skinning what looked like a deer. I was sort of froze for a second. I mean, I only moved to this yeehaw town about a year and a half ago. I'm from the Bronx, where you can see some weird stuff, but I'm definitely not used to the hunting culture, I guess. But my friend and I were just sort of frozen, though. The man looked up, covered in blood, and said, You know it's not safe for girls like you out here, right? Then, he let out a really raspy laugh, instantly chilling my bones. He picked up his frighteningly large knife and just kept skinning the deer and muttering about all the dangerous animals in these woods. My friend and I were just nodding, not sure what else to say or do really. He looked back up at us and said, There's the bears, sure, the mountain lions, the fisher cats and the rabbit coons, but the most dangerous thing out here? He leaned forward and pointed the knife. Man, the most dangerous game there is. My friend and I, we made eye contact and just, well, booked it, running through the woods, through the bushes and thorns, and eventually we found our way back to her property. We're obviously not sure if creepy hunter guy was just scaring us for giggles, but, I mean, man, it was creepy. I'd like to think that he just got a, a bit of a kick out of scaring two teenagers, but holy smokes... I was not in the mood for this dude to pull a, a Robert Hansen on us, so we got out of there, quick smart. The story that I'm about to share happened to my brother, sister, and myself back in the early 90s. I've decided to share this story because of, well, a recent family tragedy, and it brought this experience to mind. I've been thinking about it a lot, so I've decided to share it. When I was a child, I grew up in a haunted house. I've had many terrifying experiences, odd things happening, but this, this is the one that tops the cake. I was 10 years old at the time, my two older sisters, 12 and 14. We had a foreign exchange student named Amy from Germany staying with us for two weeks at the time. She was very odd and quirky, but I sort of began to enjoy her personality. I should also add too that, and this will be important, we had a dog named Cookie. He was a Shih Tzu Yorkie mix, and due to his size, he could never jump up on a couch. He would try and try until you'd finally have to pick him up and put him up on there yourself or on a chair, etc. I'd never seen him be able to jump up on our couch, but this particular day, my parents both had to go into work at the same time and ask my older sister to watch us kids for the afternoon. We were playing and goofing around for a while. Amy started to go through our parents' junk closet to see if there would be something to play with, when she all of a sudden came out of the closet ecstatic holding a tape recorder. She starts wanting to record funny things and then listen to it back. It sounded fun. And we were all having a good time making farting noises or burping, stupid stuff that kids think is funny. When all of a sudden, Amy looks at us and says, let's make scary noises in the recorder. I was a little nervous since I knew that we had scary things in our home, but eh, I went with it. As we're making these recordings, out of nowhere, Amy stood up straight and stared down the main hallway and looked directly into my room. 
I began to notice that she looked pale. So pale that it made me think that she sort of looked a little bit like a ghost. We were all sort of drawn and staring at her in confusion. But all of a sudden she brought up her right hand and covered her right eye. She put her hand down after a few seconds and then brought up her left hand, covered her left eye. And it was sort of as if she didn't believe what she was seeing or something. But it was at that point that I instantly felt the energy in the home become really thick. Almost like the air got sucked out of it or something. Like a vacuum. This all happened in maybe 30 seconds. But all of a sudden, Cookie ran towards my bedroom and was barking at the room. Then he whimpered and bolted down the hallway and jumped onto the couch. Right after that moment, we started to hear like something run full force down the hall towards us. We couldn't see it, only hear it, but we all jumped on the couch and huddled together sobbing and terrified. But we could hear it running down the hall towards us. As it reached us, we felt this massive wind go through us, and then the running would start over again as if it was a, a repeat cycle. But the energy was overwhelming and terrifying. But we could feel it every time that it ran through us as well. I've never felt that level of fear and terror in my entire life, and it's something that I'll never forget. This went on for some time though, and the neighbor to our left, that was a priest, heard us screaming and came over to check out what was happening. And as soon as he touched that doorknob, it instantly stopped. He came into us terrified and sobbing uncontrollably. He called my parents and they came home immediately. We never did hear from Amy again after that and she left three days later. I have always wondered about her though and the trauma she experienced staying with us and that effect. I hope she's okay now after what we went through in our home but anyway that's the story and I'll swear by its truth until the day that I die. The other day I was grocery shopping at my local Walmart with my four month old. While I was loading up my vehicle I heard an excuse me from behind me. My cart was very full to the point of, well, almost overflowing with larger items like toilet paper, diapers, etc. So I thought maybe something fell out of my cart at first or that I left something behind in the store. As I turned around, there was a woman about two feet away from me, which in itself startled me. She was holding a bouquet of wilted flowers and was handing me a rose saying Happy Mother's Day. Out of instinct, I reached out and took the rose from her. I immediately became hyper aware of my surroundings though and instinctively grabbed onto the cart which had my son in his car seat still in it. But the conversation then went as follows. She said, Happy Mother's Day. It was very monotone, no smile, nothing. I said, thank you. Oh, uh, I need donations. My child is very, very sick. Tries to show me a laminated but old looking piece of paper, but it was under her arm holding it. Oh, no, I'm really sorry to hear that. I don't have any cash on me to give you, sorry. Stares at me for a few seconds. But my child, I need donations. I was starting to get nervous. Uh, I'm really sorry. I, I wish I could help, but I can't. I handed the rose back to her. You don't want it? My child is really sick. You can keep the flower for yourself, and I do hope your child gets better. Sorry. She grabs the flower from me and starts running to other people in the parking lot. I was really scared at this point, and... I started to almost panic, so I put my son into my vehicle, trying not to touch him with the hand that was holding the flower because of the stories that I've been told. I then got into my vehicle and locked the doors and started washing my hands with sanitizer that I keep in the vehicle. I sat there for a few minutes making sure nobody was around me, and nothing was happening to me obviously, and then I filed a police report for suspicious behavior. Maybe I overreacted, I know, and... This woman really was looking for help for her child, but the whole situation just seemed fishy to me. Especially after she left me, she went over to other people and was even banging on their car windows at one point. While I was filing the police report as well, 
I watched a, a man driving around the same area of the parking lot, taking pictures of the same vehicle and parking in multiple different spots, then moving and taking more pictures, and so on and so forth. Needless to say, I got the heck out of there, and I didn't go back for quite some time. For context, I'm a 22-year-old woman, and this morning, I was waiting near, but not quite at, the bus station that I always use. I was minding my business, talking to my friends via text on my phone, and regularly looking to see if my bus was coming, when suddenly, I heard someone calling my name. I looked around and saw nobody that I knew, so I went back to what I was doing. But Ten seconds later, I hear it again. This time, I notice that it's coming from a white car a few feet away from me. The first red flag is that I don't know anyone that owns a white car. I went to see who it was, making sure not to get too close to the car, and it was an old man that I'd never seen before in my life. He said, Hello, I'm your Uber driver. I looked at him and asked him to repeat what he just said because I thought that I heard him wrong, but I had it. I gave him a confused look and told him that I wasn't waiting for an Uber, and when I did, he just sped away. I didn't get the chance to check the license plate or anything, but that was obviously scary on its own, but the worst part is that I think I have no idea who it was. Anyway, two weeks ago, I received a, a very, very long text message from someone that I didn't even have in my contacts. It started with, hello, and their name. You don't know who I am, but I see your photos on Facebook every day. It detailed things that I've posted on there months ago, and he also complimented really weird parts of my body, my ears, for example. He also gave me the number of moles that I have on my face, which I didn't even know myself, demonstrating that he had spent a long time examining me. It was obvious that he was trying to be romantic, but it absolutely came out as creepy instead. I must mention too that I don't have my phone number on Facebook either. I double checked because I, I thought that I never had it registered in there, and in fact I didn't. So I have no idea how or where he got it from. He had other private information that I didn't post either, and he didn't reveal his name or give any information that could lead me to finding out who he was, for real that is. And while this was creepy, I just didn't answer and ignored it because, I mean, he wasn't threatening me or anything. I didn't consider it that serious, I guess. I still told all my friends just in case anything else happened, and thankfully nothing did. Not even another text message. That is, until today. I really hope that I'm just being paranoid and that these are two separate incidences, but I can't help but think that if this person was able to get all that information so easily, he could have gotten my home address or routes that I take daily too. I've started sharing my live location at all times with my friends who are all worried about my safety since these incidents. I might go to the cops with this, but I'm really not sure if they'll take it seriously. Justice is trash here anyway, so even if I did, I really doubt that anything would come of it. So one day, my best friend and I were taking a shortcut to her house. It goes past a few houses and through a small area of the woods, crossing a two-foot wide creek. This particular day... I was wearing one of those jackets that had earbuds as the strings. It was a must-have item as a fifth grader in 2010 or 11. As we're passing one of the houses, a couple of big dogs come running from it, jumping on us and obviously just wanting to play and be petted and whatnot. The owner of the house comes out, and I noticed right away that he was acting really sort of fidgety and nervous, saying stuff about the dogs like, Oh, it's okay, they're nice, don't worry. We made small talk with him about the dogs for a few minutes and turned around to leave. About a minute or so later, we arrived at the small creek when I noticed that one of the rubber earbuds that was on my jacket was now gone, and I insisted on going back to look for it. The guy came back out again 
and even offered to help us. He asked what the material was made out of, and I said that it was made of rubber. We made small talk again. I think about the jacket and how cool it was. And anyway, he said that he was going to be right back with his metal detector. He walked away towards his shed, and I said to my friend, Why does he need a metal detector? The earbud is made of rubber. Next thing you know, he's coming back with, and I kid you not, a rifle, and he was literally running towards us. When I'm telling you that we ran, I mean we flew. When we got to safety past the creek and near her house, I was telling her that we needed to call 911. She insisted that we not do that because her parents would have been mad at her. I explained to her with urgency why it's important that we do call the cops, but she just refused and I couldn't force her. I didn't call because I didn't want to do it alone, plus it would have been my first time calling them. I can't remember when or if I even told my parents that night what happened, but when I did tell them, they gaslit me and said that I was just crazy or overreacting, that I didn't really see that. I still think about this near every day and it still haunts me. A second time was again in the fifth grade, taking place after the first story, but I'm not really sure how long after. The friend from the previous story actually lived near a cemetery, about a five minute walk from her house I would guess. It was a big cemetery too and we liked to walk around it a lot. Plus behind the cemetery was a shortcut through the woods to a big park which was coincidentally right next to our school. This day we were also with another good friend of ours. We were just walking around the cemetery this day when all of a sudden a, a blue truck pulls up next to us in the row next to where we were walking, about 10 feet away or so, not far. I could see two guys were in it, literally just staring at us, and I again got that weird feeling that I got with the first guy. It's hard to explain, but right before the shortcut in the woods is a fence with a sort of cutout that leads to a field of grass, and a hill next to it that leads into the neighborhood of where my other friend lived. The hill was really a bunch of dead grass, weeds, sticks, cattails, etc. I told my friends that I had a bad feeling about these guys, that... They were just staring at us and quite literally slowly following us with the truck. And so we booked it to that grass field and through that hill. I had all sorts of cuts and gashes from all the stuff that we were running through. But when we got to the top of the hill, we turned around and the truck was now parked at the top of the hill on the other side. And both men were outside of it, holding guns and rifles. I truly believe that... They were coming after us and they were visibly mad that we got away from them. I knew that they were after us too because they would have had to have driven through the cutout in the fence amongst the gut feelings and just the entire situation was really sketchy. We ran to my friend's house though, noticed her parents who truly didn't seem too worried and drove my other friend and me home. I don't really even remember if I told my parents about it this time since they gaslit me when I told them about the last time. But I just can't shake the fact that this really happened when I was in 5th grade, 10 or 11 years old. It's hard to believe how lightly my parents took the situation too. Quite honestly, I think I'm a bit traumatized about what happened and I think about it a lot. Anyway, I just needed to tell some people about what happened but I have trouble getting my thoughts into words so thanks for listening. So this story takes place a, a few years ago when I was younger and dumber. I'd spent all my tax returns on a trip to see a friend of mine from high school, a foreign exchange student from Germany. For two weeks, I'd be living with her and the friends that she was living with in a secluded shack on a relatively unknown island of the northern coast of, well, sort of near Denmark. Sites included beaches and farms and fields. My friend was doing conservation work, if anyone's curious. All of her friends were very kind and genuine, but it would seem that one other on the island didn't think so. So around midnight one night, I saw something in the trees. 
Everyone else had gone to bed and I was just sitting on the front porch with the neighborhood wild cat on my lap, having one of those stereotypical reflect on yourself in a foreign land moments while listening to the waves crashing on the beach just beyond the trees. And a few minutes later, I noticed that one of the trees sort of, well, moved. I didn't actually see it move per se, more like I noticed that the tree seemed somewhat wider than before, I guess. I looked down to see if the cat was seeing this, and I think that he was. He was definitely looking in the same direction that I was, but he hadn't stopped purring. I looked back to the tree, and that's when I noticed uh, new branches peeking around the trunk. And then I make eye contact with dull yellow eyes. They looked to be whittled and painted onto the wood almost, yet staring into them felt as chilling and lifeless as looking into an insect eye, but still definitely alive. I instantly though felt every hair on my body raise on end as I realized that those new branches have since wrapped around the trunk of the tree. Someone or something was spying on me. Again I looked down at the cat and He's still very relaxed and purring. I, however, was not and decided that it was time to go inside and go to bed. The rest of the trip went, well, pretty much great otherwise, but cut to a month or so later and I'm back in the States, and my friend has since moved off the island and is attending university full-time. One of the friends that I made there was still on the island, though, and he sent me a message asking if I remember seeing that fairy creature in the woods that night. I said yes, and... Then he told me something that has since been giving me incessant anxiety, especially whenever in the woods alone. You see, he and a visiting prospect were heading out for a nighttime walk along the beach, just a short stroll through the woods, when the prospect stepped on a mass that felt like jam, he said. They turned on their phone flashlights and saw up close that what I had thought was a, a fae, it was actually a man in a ghillie suit, and he was passed out next to a puddle of vomit. In the following moments, my friend proceeded to call emergency services. Police and ambulance arrived to take him away, and while they were putting the man on the stretcher, my friend said that he saw the police remove a machete and a small string of chicken wire from the man's person. The police only followed up once, and to summarize what they said was, an unnamed drunk citizen passed out on our property. If it happens again, give us a call. No mention of the machete or chicken wire at all. My friend said that he asked about this, but the person on the other line either didn't budge or genuinely had no idea what he was talking about. All the people that I met on the island have since left, and so I really have had no updates since then. I still have no idea what that man was planning on doing, but I have a hunch that... Or whatever it was, it wasn't good. I'm especially sure of this because I did see him a month before peeking out at me from behind a tree. I really don't want to think about what was going on inside of his head, but I worry for the safety of those volunteers there now, and what that random man might be planning to do to them. So I'm not the type of person to believe this kind of stuff, especially because I'm not superstitious at all, but these two encounters really made me doubt whatever is going on on this farm. The first encounter occurred when me and my two friends were having dinner. Everything was calm, we were eating outside, since this was a relatively big space. That was until we heard a woman scream which was really odd since the country that I live in is really calm with very few criminals really or even animal attacks since we were in the wilderness after all. I'm the first one to react. I climbed to the wall that separated the house grounds from the animal parts. From there I could see almost all the houses near mine but my friends caught up right after me. We stay in total silence waiting for another scream and we heard it. But this time we could understand what she said help. She yelled this and then a bunch of gibberish that no one could really understand. But one of my friends quickly grabs the phone to call the cops as we assume it could be domestic violence or a robbery or something. I grab an axe. My other friend follows me to the gate and we didn't leave. 
Nobody knew what we could find, and since something sounded odd about those screams, we weren't quite sure if we should go there or not yet. Plus, I mean, it was difficult to actually pinpoint where it was coming from. But right before the police arrived, we hear this thud and then glass breaking. I assumed that it was a window, but as soon as the police arrived, the screams just stop, never to be heard again. The police found nothing too, and... Later that night, me and my friend stayed up, chatting about what happened. One of them was oddly quiet, but when I asked him what was wrong, he simply said, I've heard those screams before. And apparently, he had heard that woman scream a couple of times while he was walking his dog at some point. Anyway, that was weird, but the next day we get up and we decide to go back to check the house and the screams, maybe where they were coming from, but... There was one really weird thing about it when we arrived at the place. You see, there was no house. It was just, well, forest terrain really, with nothing more than big trees and bushes for miles. We came back and we decided to forget about what happened since we wanted to have a good time. No one would relate this encounter with a skinwalker, obviously. I didn't either at first, but when it happened twice... I started connecting everything. You see, the second encounter happened when my cousins were over. Similar to the previous night. We were all having a good time, a peaceful dinner. That's when me and my cousin decided to go for a little walk in the garden that we had. And The garden made frontier with a huge forest, only separated by a small stone wall. And we were just talking and laughing when I start to hear a man talking. Not in a normal voice though, it's sort of... Sounded like there was something in his throat, maybe? It produced a sort of weird voice frequency, I guess. Again, though, I go to grab my axe, and my cousin calls his sister. We get ourselves near the wall to hear what he was saying. Like the first encounter, we could only understand gibberish coming from him. And he just wouldn't stop talking. Like, what I mean is that he was not even taking breaks to catch his breath or anything. It was just a... An endless line of gibberish. After a while of listening to it, we realized that we couldn't do anything about it, so we leave and finish our dinner. They leave, and I find myself alone in here at one point. It was quite unsettling to say the least. But then I start overthinking more and more, and I remember the times my dog would spend entire nights barking at that forest, when most of the animals that were there were wiped out by hunters at this point. I remember the warnings my parents gave me when I was a child to always leave that forest and lock all the doors before sunset and regardless of my questions, they would never tell me why. Because, as I mentioned before, it was a really calm little location in a calm country. So I just couldn't understand why so many worries. Thankfully, though, it all seemed to end when the lumberjacks came to cut down all the grown trees, leaving the forest pretty much visible. But before the trees were cut down, you couldn't really see much in there, even during the daytime. After they cut the trees and the good weather came, nothing weird really ever happened again. Even my dog stopped barking at the wall. Anyway, I don't know what to think about all of this, and... I would like to know if you guys think that I'm just being paranoid or if maybe there's more to this. So I worked the late shift to pay for university and I would come home at midnight most nights. I share a house with my mum and park my car in a garage that she can open with a remote control. You can get straight into the house through a door that connects the garage with the basement, which I normally do, except for Thursdays that is, where I go around the house to pull our trash can onto the street and then enter through the main door. Our house is surrounded by tall bushes so you can't really see much from the street. It's a small rural village and I know all of my neighbours very well. And well, on a, a Thursday night I was returning from my shift and when I drove into our street, I noticed an unfamiliar car with its headlights on. Since I know my neighborhood so well, I was kind of confused about the car, but couldn't see the license plate, nor the person sitting in the car clearly since the light was blinding me. 
You can only drive into our street when you live there or visit someone there, since it only circles back to the main street when you follow it to the end. In any case, I opened the gate and the garage door remotely and drove inside. From that point, I can only see the street through the gate, since the bushes are so high here on both sides that, like I said, it's pretty hard to see. I normally would have left the car and walked outside to grab the trash can, but that day I just got a long voice message from a friend and I stayed in my car to listen to it. Seven minutes into the message, I lift my gaze and look into my rearview mirror and see a, a man standing in my driveway behind my car. He didn't move in any way, he just sort of stood perfectly still and seemed to be watching me. I panicked and I locked the doors, then grabbed the remote and closed the extremely slow garage gate. I just sat there for a moment and I was too scared to leave the car since I couldn't be sure that he didn't enter the garage before the door reached the floor. I also had to call my mother because the garage door into the basement was locked since I had planned to use the main door like I do every Thursday. She later told me that she immediately went to the window she can overview the street since she lives on the first floor, but couldn't see the man or the car at that point. I told myself at the time that it probably was just a neighbor who didn't think about how creepy he acted and that I didn't recognize in the dark or something, but I asked around and nobody knew that guy. I only got the information that the type of car was seen slowly driving around our neighborhood in the last few days. But my mum thinks that it was somebody that wanted to surprise me and force me to let him into the house to rob us or something. My grandma had just died and nobody knew that my mum spent the nights over, I guess. She thinks that he waited behind the bushes and got impatient or confused when I didn't exit the car. And unfortunately, we never actually found out who it was. So I was telling this story to a school friend today and he said that maybe I should share it here and ask if anyone knows of an explanation. Here's some background info. So I, a 16 year old male, and my father were hog hunting in southern Tennessee. We've taken trips to hunt for various game every year just after. This year though, we had a good season for deer and didn't want to let the hunting be over, so we decided to hunt hogs. If you didn't know, Hogs are an absolute nuisance of a species, meaning that they can be hunted any time of the year. He had come with me to my stand and gave me general directions to his if I needed up needing them or whatever. I didn't see anything all afternoon to be honest and as soon as the sun began to set I heard what then sounded like gunshots and then squealing from the direction that I understood was my dad's stand. I sat for a moment and decided that I'd go and take a look and see if he had gotten anything. Seeing as the sun was already setting, I figured that it'd be better to help with well, what little light we had. After about three minutes of walking, I came up at what I thought was his stand, though it was more like a shack, I guess. It looked very unkept and rickety. In any case, I approached it and saw my dad through a gap in one of the walls that I assumed was a shooting window. I whispered, asking him if he'd gotten anything, he very slowly turned to look at me. If you hunt, then you know that your head movements must be slow as not to alert any game. But this wasn't that. It was more of a, I don't know, a foreign movement. But one resembling that of a, a serial killer almost in some dumb horror movie or something. He looked at me with a blank expression for a minute. Well, not completely blank, but it had a slight hint of anger, but... I quickly chalked it up to my dad wondering why I'd leave my stand before he called. Seeing that I decided that he was not ready to leave, I made my way back to my stand without questioning him any further. Sure enough, my dad called my phone a few minutes after I got back to my stand, saying that he was coming to get me and that we'd leave. On the way home, I asked him why he didn't say anything when I came by, and he sort of looked at me confused and said something along the lines of, you never came to me. I laughed briefly and asked, no, seriously, 
My dad is a jokester, but not a prankster or someone who likes scaring people, but he was dead serious. He genuinely stated that I never came to see him at all. The next day, after trying for a while to brush it off, I asked him to show me his stand. And it was not the one that I had went to. And when I went to find where I'd went, there was nothing but a field. No stand at all. Now, I've tried to rationalize it time and time again, but I still have no idea what really happened. At this point, I want to believe my dad is steadfast in his attempt to spook me, or well, that I imagined it somehow, but I know what happened, and to be honest, I believe my dad. Does anyone have a more accurate idea of what it was? I've always jokingly said that it was a skinwalker, but to be honest, I kind of wonder what it really was now. So please, if you have any thoughts, then do share them. This happened about six years ago when I was 14. It was Sunday night around 7pm or so and I was at my church's west campus for youth group. At youth group, we would often play hide and seek at the end of the night while we waited for our parents to come and pick us up. We always really enjoyed it because the west campus has a lot of dark rooms in the basement to hide in. One room in particular was the costume room. The costume room was one of the last in the hallway and had two doors that you could enter it from. One door was always locked though for whatever reason. But the doors were about six to eight feet away from each other so if you picked the locked door you could get to the unlocked one pretty quickly. Something else about the costume room is that it is very cluttered. There are racks upon racks of clothing and different props everywhere. As you can imagine, the room had a lot of places where you could hide easily. Now, on this Sunday, we finished early, so we had about 30 minutes to sort of play hide and seek, which we were all stoked about. The game began, and we all quickly dispersed into the many rooms of the West Campus. As I ran down the hallway, many of the kids picked the closet rooms to hide in, which is also what I normally did, but everyone had beat me to those rooms, and I didn't want to hide with a bunch of other people, so I ran to the end of the hallway to the costume room. But the first door was locked, so I went to the second one and entered the dark room. Once I was inside, I hurried through all the clothing racks and made my way to the back and hid behind some props. As I was hiding, I could hear doors opening and closing and walking around outside in the hall. I was so focused on those sounds that I almost didn't notice the sound of shuffling on the other side of the room. My first thought was that maybe somebody else had gotten here to hide before I did, so... I whispered very quietly, hey, who else is in here? I got no reply though. My second thought was that there was probably a mouse or some kind of an animal in there that was moving about. But that was until some of the costumes on the rack had fallen down. At this point, my heart is racing. I started to think that somebody was trying to scare me and quite frankly it was working too. So I whispered again, please, who's in here? This isn't funny. And again, I got no reply. I worked up some courage and decided to slowly make my way over to the other side of the room to find out who was trying to prank me like this. When I got into the rack where the clothes had fallen from, there was definitely nobody there. I sort of picked up the clothes off the floor and hung them back up because... I was just going to hide there now because I didn't want to move again and get caught by the seeker. By this time, I'd been hiding for maybe, I would say, five to seven minutes at most. When suddenly, someone started knocking on the door. When I tell you that I nearly jumped out of my skin, that's an understatement. But at the same time the knocking happened, the props that I had originally hid behind tumbled to the floor. I almost had a heart attack at this. The knocking stopped. The sound that took its place was the sound of both door handles being sort of jiggled, followed by, is somebody in there? I popped up out of my spot at this point and ran to the door, but it was locked. I ran to the other door and it was locked too. And the thing about this is that there was only one key to unlock the doors and the person who had it was not there that night, so... How the heck did the unlocked door that I had entered through magically just become locked like that? 
By now, I'm screaming and banging on the door with tears rolling down my cheeks. Stop holding the door shut, my youth pastor yelled. I screamed at the top of my lungs. I'm not, I'm not holding it. Then, to put the cherry on top, the entire rack of clothes fell over, which just shouldn't have happened. Like, not just the clothes on it, the whole rack was pushed over. If I wasn't freaking out before, I definitely was now. I ran over to check the other door again, and now it was all of a sudden unlocked again. You can bet your sweet buns that I ran as fast as I could, right past my youth pastor and friends, right up the stairs and into the bathroom. About two minutes later, my friends followed me into the bathroom and they asked me what had been so funny. They said to me, we heard you laughing down there. Why did you break those props? They heard laughing coming from the room that I was in? But I didn't hear any laughing and I definitely wasn't laughing in there. I told them what happened, but they just didn't believe me. They thought that I had planned this whole story to try and scare them. I don't know what else was in that room with me that night, but by the sound of it, it had a good laugh, scaring my very soul right out from my skin. So this happened back in 2017 and other than a couple of people in my family, I never really shared this because until this day, I just can't come to a rational conclusion as to what exactly happened. So a little background on myself first. I do come from a somewhat religious family so rule numero uno was never dabble in any occult games or anything that had to do with ghosts. So naturally, there was always that curiosity as a kid of what could be out there, but for the most part, I could only imagine through stories from my elders and whatever I saw in TV and movies, but that all changed on one August night in 2017. Now, to put this in perspective, I'm 21 years old, around 6 feet tall at the time. It was a pretty calm night and I was spending it at my grandma's house before I needed to head back for school for my senior year of college. So it's around 2am and I'm pretty much done for the night. I lay down on my right side facing the wall and close my eyes to go to sleep. And now I'm in that transition stage of sort of wakefulness and sleep when suddenly I hear a tap. Now usually I would just ignore stuff like this because I'm a pretty heavy sleeper. To give a quick example of how heavy a sleeper I am too, when I was like 9, the sprinkler system in my house went off and I slept through the whole thing. It wasn't until my parents woke me that I realized that I was soaking wet, and I initially had thought that it was just raining and I had left the window open because this was when I lived in Florida and this was a, a normal experience for me sleeping, close the window. But anyways, for some reason this tap woke me up out of my sleep. I tried ignoring it, but... It just wouldn't stop. I then opened my eyes to see where the sound was emitting from and as soon as I locked my eyes with the spot on the wall where it seemed to be coming from, it stops. So I'm like, well that was weird, but whatever, I'm just going to go back to sleep. I close my eyes and then the tapping starts again, so I look at the spot and it stops again. In my head I'm like, ah, it's just a coincidence or there's something in the damn wall again messing around. At first I thought maybe it was just a bug that I couldn't see but man, I was sadly mistaken. After locking eyes with the spot for a couple of minutes and not hearing anything, I just turned to my left side and closed my eyes to go back to sleep. When it starts again, now... I'm getting creeped out by this and turn around to the spot real fast and it stops again. I'm like, what is happening? Is there something toying with me right now? After that too, it was like clockwork because now I was keeping my eyes open looking away from the spot with the noise and it would start and then I would look back and it would stop. I get the sense that whatever the heck is making this noise knows that I'm looking at it. And it's letting me know that it knows that I'm looking at it by continuing to tap and stop whenever I look in that proximity of the noise. I close my eyes and I feel myself getting goosebumps and my eyeballs get watery and tears begin to flow. Which is weird for me because 
Really nothing too crazy had happened and I'm not someone who gets teary eyed often. Maybe as a kid but I'm long past that era now. So in my head I'm thinking I'm having a real physical reaction to this and I don't know why since it's just tapping. So now my mind is racing and the fear and the panic just overtake me and I just sort of lay there frozen until I somewhat snap out of it and call my mum who was at our other house. I explain the situation to my mum and she gives me some rational explanations as to what it could be. So my mind begins to calm a bit. I notice the tapping stopped. Unfortunately, after a few minutes on the phone, I hear a scratching noise next to me though. And then, very faintly next to my ear, I hear a woman's giggle. But the vibe felt just wrong. As soon as that noise started, I suddenly felt a cold breeze and chill run through my entire body too. I started freaking out and then my body begins to tense up and I start having some kind of a muscle spasm. All I could remember is that I could barely control my fingers, arms, legs and toes. My panicking wakes up my grandma to find me tweaking in my bed. Now she's panicking but thank goodness as soon as she turned on the lights to the room I was able to somewhat snap out of it and run to her room. I just jumped into her bed and remembering feeling cold like a block of ice and I couldn't stop shivering. Mind you, it was a hot summer night so that was really weird. Eventually, my mum comes over and they take me to the living room. As I'm sitting down, I can see the room that I was in with the door still open but the lights were off. I don't know why but whenever I stared into the dark door frame, I just began to have the same feeling of fear and coldness again and even began crying a little bit and forced them to close the door because I felt as if a, a presence was there, standing in that doorway, peering at me through the darkness of that room. Eventually, I calmed down and I went to the doctor because we didn't know what actually happened to me, but of course, everything was fine, which only confirmed my suspicion that what had happened to me was a reaction to whatever was in that room, and till this day... I still don't have an answer. Luckily for me, the next day I went back to my college dorm for the new semester. I never felt like such a wimp in my life to be honest, but I guess no matter how old you are, at the end of the day, fear has no prejudice. On a side note too, the bed that I slept in was old and gifted to my grandma. One time late at night in the kitchen I heard a growl behind me too. Another time I had a night terror where an old lady chased me through a forest and eventually caught up to me and grabbed my ankle with a hot sort of burning sensation. I woke up screaming and felt like my ankle was warm and it was actually a little bit red. It was the scariest dream of my life and I still don't know what happened there. This all happened on different days but it was all in the same house. I don't know what is going on in that house but what do you guys think? So this was three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, and it's now one of my favorite stories to tell, now that I'm no longer scared, and I've moved like a thousand miles away, and a few years time has passed too. So my husband, he was in the military during this time, and I was a housewife due to work being hard for me to get in my area. I can't drive, and I lived off base. Well, any military person knows, military schedule is pretty darn predictable, and much of our lives ran on easy to memorize schedules and to make matters worse, my husband was often gone for long hours at a time. For about two-ish to three-ish months, I'd say, I'd been seeing this guy wandering around my home peeking in windows. Honestly, I didn't originally think much of it, beyond being weirded out, obviously. But we didn't have anything that would interest a robber. No TV, a single seven-year-old computer broken couch and table, a mattress on the floor, literally nothing expensive in our home beyond a, a gun that was locked up in a safe that may have looked like it had stuff I guess, but that's a lot of work for what looks like the home of people living in poverty, right? So I don't really think anything of it. Yet, he kept coming back when my husband was gone. I'd see him every few days or hear him due to my normally super sweet cat at the time hating him and hissing and yowling when he saw him so I'd know that he was there when I hear my cat making an angry fuss. 
Well, one day, I, I went out with my husband, and I guess I didn't lock the door or something properly, as our lock could be a, a bit funny, and I was running late. According to our normal schedule, I would have gone off base with my husband for family mandatory fun, and I would have come back home alone in an Uber while my husband stayed on the base to work or hang with friends and whatnot. But what ended up happening was I fell sick with a migraine, and his sergeant told him to take me home and take care of me when he saw me. Now, before I go on, I should probably describe my old home. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment complex in the mountains. It was a massive complex. My home layout was this. My front door led to my kitchen and dining area. My kitchen and dining area wall next to my door was another glass door. Think a sort of patio door, I guess. Across from my kitchen was my room. Then you go down the hall and hit the living room that has another glass door wall next to the fireplace. And finally, after that, you go across the living room at the end of the hall and you hit our guest room, or my plant room, cat's playroom, guest room sort of thing, with yet another glass door wall. I was literally surrounded by giant glass doors is what I'm getting at. Then outside we had a porch and on the porch was a storage closet where I usually kept my bike as I couldn't drive due to my migraines and seizures and whatnot. So, when my husband brought me home again, not per our normal schedule, we came home to find our door slightly ajar. We gave each other a look and went inside anyways with me mumbling about how I must have not locked properly due to us being in a rush that morning. We walked into the kitchen where my husband immediately went to the fridge and started looking around for water for himself and me. He then spoke for the first time while in the fridge. Honestly, I don't really remember what he even said. But then we heard something, maybe a few seconds after he spoke. Our porch glass door in the back of our home moved. We both knew the sound really well too, as I liked to sit on the porch reading for hours, so I was always coming in and out. He then grabbed my shoulder and whispered to grab his gun from our room, and he then grabbed a butcher's knife and went towards the living room. I went and grabbed the gun, noticing on my way into our room that down the hall that our living room glass porch door was, it was wide open. Upon giving my husband the gun and following behind him as I dialed 911 in my panic, saying that I had an active break-in while my husband did a sweep of our home, and while I was on the phone, upon coming back down the hall towards the kitchen to see if he went around back to get up to the front, it was the only way out of the area that he went, as we lived on a literal mountainside and one side was blocked off our back. We heard our storage door out back that we forgot to shut, slam open. Me and my husband ran out back where we found our storage door swinging open and just barely saw the same guy who'd been spying on me and our home. Obviously, he didn't end up coming back that day. I also later found that the only things missing were some of my clothes, lingerie, and bathroom care products. The police... They showed up four hours later and took a statement from me and my husband. Eventually, my husband had to return to his normal schedule. I was terrified and he didn't like it, but he also had no choice until we could find a new place in three months when our contract ended. And to be honest, the first few weeks were pretty much fine. He didn't come back. My cat didn't yowl or throw any fits, so he didn't see him either. But things were fine that week. Then, another week went by and I started to think maybe the gun that we brought out scared him or something. The third week, though, he ended up coming back while my husband was at work in the morning. He first tried the door and was trying to force it open and then started banging on the glass next to the door. I put 911 on speaker and texted my husband while I panicked and cried. While I was on the 911 call, he ended up leaving the front door, giving up I guess, and when I voiced that he walked away from the door to the 911 dispatcher, the lady who was speaking to me thought that I was being ridiculous, freaking out this badly over someone trying to get into my locked door. I hung up and finally called my husband while I had a full on panic attack and it turns out that he was already coming home with a car full of his and my friends also in the army and who work with him as they turned around towards me as soon as I texted what was going on. 
And this guy, he ended up going to the back door and trying both glass doors there as well before finally giving up. About four minutes later, my husband and his friends arrived and found me clutching my cat and crying. They ended up scanning the area and still didn't find him. The cops, they showed up seven hours later and I, very angry this time, gave another report. I ended up with three of the guys sleeping over in the spare room that night and my husband and me, we slept in our now locked and bolted bedroom. I got a lock installed on the bedroom door after the first time. Then, the next day, my and my husband's friends went out and got and installed cameras in all of our doors and window areas. After this last time, beyond him going back to looking in our windows three more times, thankfully I never had another issue. I moved out shortly thereafter this too and since then uh, I never saw him again.